Will be to the September 12th meeting of the Frenchman Heights Village Council. Uh, we will begin as we usually do with uh, comments from uh, questions from residents. Fire. Yes, I don't need a mic. Yeah, please. So uh, and, and I, I don't know who you want to identify okay. yourself for me and your residents. Ladies and gentlemen, you are aware that recent decisions by the council that involve large expenditures of the village reserve have generated a number of different views and opinions among residents. Excuse me, Clara, could you use the microphone? Yeah. There is no microphone. No. The Zoom requires so that the two people can hear. Yeah, just I can talk louder. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so there are different opinions about the, the use of the reserve. If you talk with residents who have been in the village for some years, in my case, 19, part time, full time, there is no difference of opinion about the fact that the reserve that the village enjoyed at the end of the last fiscal year, six million plus, took a long time to build. 20 years or so, many people contributed to that effort, several treasurers, other members of the council. But I think the work of one person stood out during that period, and that was Bob Shapiro, who had different titles over the years, was always the number two person in managing the village, and was de facto or formally the CFO. Bob worked very hard on that for many years. In November, it will be one year since Bob's passing. I have kept in touch with his wife, Elise, and I know, as does Julian, that Elise has an idea for honoring her husband. Very appropriate idea. Her individual initiative. It won't cost the village anything. Uh, and it does not require council action. But given the role that Bob played in this community, the length of time that he served, and his role in the fiscal management of the village. I have to ask whether the council is thinking about some kind of formal recognition of his service, some, I don't know in what form, but something that the community would express to the family and to the residents. I'm just raising the question because I have not seen a discussion of this matter on council agendas. There, I'm sure there are things going on behind the scenes that I'm not aware of, but I would appreciate it as would many other residents if you could give it serious consideration. Thank you. You want to briefly respond to that? Um, yes, I was going to address this issue next month. I didn't put it on. I didn't ask to be able to put it on the schedule today, but it's so long that I'm going to give this the time that, that it deserves. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. I'm Bobby Pestron. I live at 4701 Willard Avenue, and I'm following your instructions tonight instructions to the public as I've heard them repeatedly. First, I've attended many council meetings for the past six months. Second, I've read past minutes to inform myself of the village affairs and council actions. Third, I've spoken to several council members, current and former, and village staff. Fourth, I've examined the backgrounds, statements, and priorities of current council members and I've listened to the responses of council members to public comment at village meetings. I've learned through these actions 
that members of the council, to varying degrees, want members of the public to express their opinions publicly and to the council. Have an abiding, active, and continuing interest in the history and preservation of the area now known as French and Heights. Feel that democracy and compromise are important elements of interaction among public and council to preserve the lovely community <clears throat> that we have and to prevent polarization and intolerance so destructive elsewhere. And also finally believe quality of life for residents, particularly seniors and those with special needs is a high priority. With these instructions and learnings in mind, I'm asking the council to do several things. First, send a letter to County Parks and Planning, which expresses the council's support for improvements to Willard Avenue Neighborhood Park, which would follow a letter that you previously sent. Second, list as desired improvements for the parcel at 5320 Willard Avenue and in the text of your letter, designs to preserve the park, which only add to the quiet, green, lush, meditative nature of the current parcel and park, thereby protecting immediate neighbors in homes and facing apartments from noise and clutter from other than that human interaction. To wit and specifically, preserve and avoid the destruction of the blue home at 5320 Willard, the oldest in the area, now known as Friendship Heights, with its extraordinary cultural significance and continuing potential to generate income. Second, maintain some form of solid wall and shrubbery now provided by two homes on the newly purchased parks property at the intersection of Willard Avenue and River Road. Third, between the Blue Home, now a rental property, and Willard Avenue, first, create a mini park within a park accessible to humans with physical challenges and other disabilities. Second, establish a community garden. Third, install walkways, benches, tables, and gaming tables for picnicking and quiet gaming, perhaps even a, a bike locking structure for those passing through the area. Fourth, permanently enjoin the installation of a dog park there or elsewhere in Willard Avenue Neighborhood Park, since available funds need not be reserved for that purpose or a skate park. Fifth, continue to allow, as is now the case, throughout the park, access to dogs on a leash. I look forward to your support for this proposal through conversations with parks and planning officials, county elected officials, and your forthcoming formal letter to them, which I think is yes, I think they'll be pleased with the leadership and flexibility demonstrated by village council on this issue. Reuse of county property will support a collaborative design and construction process and serve a broad constituency of current and future community residents. And I thank you for the opportunity to address you tonight. Mr. Chairman, a couple of questions. Yes. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I may have missed it. Your name and the building you live in? At the beginning, Bobby Pestron at 4701 Willard. 4701. 4701. Yeah. Um, and secondly, I just want to be clear. Uh, did I understand you to say that you want to see the house remain? Yes. The blue house? I did. Uh, well, I'm going to be straightforward with you. I was one of the earliest proponents of the voting house. So I'm going to be straightforward. Right. Uh, I, I, I disagree with you on that point. However, on the rest of it, uh, we met mm, maybe three years ago with Park and Planning to tr uh, try to propose uh, doing some of the things that you just mentioned with the property. And we were told that by Park and Planning at that time, 
that that wasn't going to happen. We uh, so I just wanted you to know that that um, it had been addressed three years ago, and you can address it again. But I do oppose leaving the house there. So yes, I, 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 uh, just for the yeah. uh, this this issue was on our agenda tonight. Oh, and we're going to have a full discussion of what the options are and what this council wishes to do. So I read and going back and forth on it now. Bobby's made his points. Thank you for yeah, that, Bobby. We'll have a discussion. Okay. Yes. Cool. Hi. Um, I, I don't think that the couldn't hear you very well. Sorry, <laughs> my ear. I'm getting it's okay. Me too. Right. Um, so, would you? What was your position on the possibility on the concept of a dog park? How would you? I, I would like that to be permanently taken off the list. Veto. Okay. Veto. All right. right. Okay. I don't have. I support dogs on a leash through the park, as is the case now. And also in this mini park um, that I propose as well. Okay. No. okay. Just one. No, thank, thank you for you. clarification. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. I wanted to say something. Do you want to talk to all more? No, I just wanted to make the point that, that this is not in our jurisdiction. Yeah, but it's something we've taken a position on and we discuss. Yes. Hi, everybody. I'm Sandra Eula. I've lived in Friendship Heights for 28 years and have enjoyed every minute of it, thanks to all of you. So I really want to thank you for that. I worked uh, for Park and Planning in the planning department for 22 years. I retired two and a half years ago. I worked in zoning and historic preservation. I have lived for 28 years at 4701 Willard Avenue, the high rise building near the Willard Avenue Park. So I wanted to speak to you a little bit about my studies of the house and the park and my ideas. Uh, I was the historian for the West Florid plan. So I've been studying history in this area for a long time including finding that African-American cemetery, which was quite the thing. So anyway, um, regarding the uh, circa 1898 Edwin C. and Julia Soliam Reynolds House at 5320 Willard Avenue, um, it is, as you know now, the oldest building on Willard, one of the oldest in the area, and the only Queen Anne-style building on Willard Avenue. It predates Willard Avenue, it's that old which is why it actually faces River Road. Look at it and you'll see that the porch is facing River Road. It's the only house left on Willard Avenue that stood along the short-lived Glen Echo Railroad when that railroad, meaning trolley line, was operational, which was about 1891 to 1902. And as we all know very well in Friendship Heights, trolley lines spurred the growth of our area. The relationship to the railroad is very evident in this case. The park trail behind the house is where the railroad ran. The house has had few changes. The yards are intact. The, the, the side along Willard is the side yard and the rest of the park with the basketball court and the uh, adult equipment is in fact the front of the house. And most of the park is its yard. The house is one of four still standing built by descendants of Louis Soliam, a Hungarian Im immigrant who built land, who bought land in 1875. And he gave this, he was a Library of Congress linguist, very well known. And as his children grew, he gave them land off of this, this eight acre tract in keeping with rural custom. Now, the first owner of the house, Edwin Reynolds, he was the husband of Julia Reynolds, daughter of Louis Soliam. He was a civil engineer, Edwin Reynolds, and a surveyor. Now he's very much connected to the development of our area. So he prepared the 1892 Chevy Chase Village plat. That's a very significant plat. That is a local historic district on the master plan for historic preservation. And it's also a national register eligible district, and as you know, it became a model for suburban planning nationwide. In 1908, even more locally, he prepared the plat 
for the West Friendship Subdivision. And what is that? That's the neighborhood down at the end of the street. So he created the original lots and street layout for that single family neighborhood. So he has hyper local significance, we might say. And I can tell you as a historic preservationist, we don't often have the designer of, of a subdivision left live, living right next door to the subdivision. Furthermore, in 1897, Mr. Reynolds surveyed Clara Barton's Glen Echo property, and he added wiring and electric doorbells and call bells to her home, which was also the Red Cross headquarters. So that building is a very significant building. It's now a Montgomery County Master Plan's historic site. It's a national historic site, and it's a national landmark. And our Edwin Reynolds had something to do with that. So that's a great thing. And that's probably a trolley story because the trolley, the trolley line here, the Glen Echo line, finally improved enough in 1897 that it was easy to get over to that side of the county. And um, Clara Barton had moved back to the site in Glen Echo because she finally got good trolley lines out there. She'd been there in 1891 and gone back to DC. Uh, Mr. Reynolds' mother knew Clara Barton well, and Mr. Reynolds' father-in-law also knew Clara Barton. They all met in Constantinople, which is another story. Um, talking now about the park, the park is a small linear park. It's bisected by a stream. It's ringed by homes and some woods. Essentially, the nature of that park is that it's everybody's shared backyard stream valley park. It gives everybody a slice of nature just two blocks from the metro station. Functionally, the Reynolds house is a point of visual interest along the trail and also, of course, from the street. It frames the park and it helps in create that enclosed backyard feel. It buffers the stream and the trail from the considerable noise of Willard Avenue, thus creating the quietude that we all prize there. And if we take the house down, and even if we don't put the dog park, you will still get considerable Willard Avenue traffic. And we all know because we live on that end. And it creates eyes on the trail, which enhances the safety of the trail. I'll just say from a land use perspective, back in the early 2000s, I helped write the rules for dog related uses in the zoning ordinance. So now we're in the odd situation where the park Parks Department is trying to put dog parks in down county areas to meet a need, but under the zoning ordinance, privately operated dog uses would be severely restricted or not allowed at all on this R60 zoned property surrounded by homes and apartments. So that's the odd situation we're in, in now as Parks tries to meet a real demand. Um, citizens are used to more guardrails than this, which is why I think the Norwood folks got so upset and they just did not understand what was going on. So I, re I request respectfully that we please protect the Reynolds House and um, resist in future from advocating for its uh, uh, risk raising because it's actually a very important part of our shared history. It's wonderful what we've learned about this house. Um, please recognize the considerable burdens that dog parks place on the immediate neighbors, even as it gives a benefit to a wider range of people in a farther geographic distance. And finally, let's seek a cross-jurisdictional solution through a joint urban design study. I'm a planner. I'm interested in solutions. The Montgomery County Planning Department is has a budget item for an urban design project on Friendship Heights. Let's work cross jurisdictionally. We all know we're gonna have hundreds, if not thousands of departments, and we're gonna to have to do something. And the best thing is to cite it somewhere and come up with innovative procurement and funding solutions. Thank you, and I appreciate all your help. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, first of all, thanking you and supporting, I believe, uh, the village uh, the red yes. historical. You know that was quite a feat, and, yes. and the planning department and the parks department staff uh, 
opposed us. Yeah. There were three commissioners that did support us, um, but uh, the staff felt that uh, as a community that uh, had prospered and built because of the um, um, the trolley line, uh, they had already designated essentially the town of Somerset, uh, and we simply felt that this was not the county standards appropriate. Uh, personally, uh, we know the village has bought that property. Right. Um, we cannot spend money beyond our jurisdiction, or I probably would be suggesting something to save that. But it seemed very unlikely, at least to me, and to testify in favor of historical property uh, that the, the staff is going to change their mind for something which I would point out is not surrounded by our 60 property, but 47 on Willard uh, Avenue apartments where most of the people in the petition uh, live. Uh, is not R60. No, it's and across the street is really not right next to it. So I, I understand, and you certainly gave a very interesting history, but um, I, I probably support them in the delay. What's the Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Anna Oliveri. My husband and I are retired. Speak, and speak slower, speak slower. Speak slower, too. Thank my, you. My name is Anne Oliveri. My husband and I are retired, and we live at 5326 Willard Avenue, overlooking Willard Avenue Park. I am here to ask you to withdraw your support of the proposed dog park to be located adjacent, adjacent on our property line of the last 25 years. Our house is a Sears house. While our property is zero feet from the proposed dog park property line, it is less than 50 feet from the 95-year-old windows of my living room and dining room. So we oppose the dog park for the same reason you would if it was next to where you live. The noise. Single barking dog is 120 decibels. A rock concert is 110. Park staff told us that fencing can only reduce that by five decibels. But there is something larger at stake here. The house at 5320 is torn down and replaced with the dog park. You will destroy the unique nature of the entire park. You will lose the sound buffer blocking street noise and replace it with barking dogs from sunrise to sunset. It will destroy our quiet, shady forest and oasis in a dense urban area. Willard Avenue Park should never have been included in the list of possible sites. First, 5320 does not meet the Parks Department Dog Park Suitability Study criteria for distance from residential property. Mind. And two, the rest of the park is in a flood plan. And so when they put this on the list, Parks Department knew that the only possible location was 5320, that everything else had been moved out. It's a mistake that can be corrected by withdrawing your support. After all, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Don't let them pay paradise and put up a 13,000 square foot dog park. Thank you. Thank you. I had a great so I was sick. Okay. Okay, I'm, first of all, I'm Manisha Rafa. I'm the person who wrote the petition, um, Mr. Muller, and I don't know how You've been Excuse me. Can you tell us who you are? Oh, you're sure. Um, my name is Manisha Renka. My husband and I own a house down the street on Willard. We live there with our five and a half year old daughter and our Scottish Terrier. So if you've seen a Scotty around here, it's ours. It's, that's our dog. Um, I'm here today to express my opposition to the dog park planned at Willard Avenue Neighborhood Park. I'm against the dog park, not because it's what's best for me, because I have a dog. I would love a dog park, but it's not best for the community. The space at Willard Avenue, at Willard Avenue Park does not work for a dog park. So first let's talk about the proximity to a toddler. If you've been to that park, you know how close it is. And if you're a parent in that park, it's there's a difference in knowing there are dogs just feet, 100, you know, 100 feet away or not knowing there are dogs. When you're watching a toddler, your eyes will have to be on them every single second. You'll have to follow them if there's a dog park right there. It'll change the complete ethos and environment of that park. 
And secondly, as much as I wish this were the case, the dog owners who frequent the park are not the best handlers. I often see people on their cell phone texting or on the phone, they don't watch their dog. Furthermore, they actually don't pick up after their dogs. You have to play, if you're walking on the grass to, to pick up your own dog's fecal matter, you won't, you'll see plenty every time. I, I mean, I count. This last time, I think I saw two fives in my five minute walk in the park. People don't pick up after their dogs. And with the introduction of a dog park, that problem is only going to be amplified. Um, additionally, I think you all know who the Little Falls Watershed Alliance is. We get weekly emails in, on our listserv. Every week, we're, we've been failing the pollution test. And they noted, they specifically cited dog fecal matter as one of the reasons. So again, with the introduction of a dog park, that problem is going to be exacerbated. So I actually did my research on this. I contacted the preeminent dog park architect in North America. Her name is Leslie Lowe. And I talked to her about it. She said, for an urban dog park, you need to have at minimum one acre or 43,560 feet. The proposed area that, that Parks is proposing is 13,000, I think it's 13,500 feet. It's less than a quarter, it's around a quarter of an acre. So, and here's what she writes. If we're serious about reducing dog conflicts in parks, we need to do better than put up a fence and call it a dog park. Conflicts occur where space is limited. Ladies and gentlemen, the total size of the proposed park is 13,500 square feet. That is not enough space. A dark park of this size would cause more problems than it would solve. As an alternative, let's find a larger space so that my dog can play and your dogs can play, a, a proper sized dog park. I did a quick search, and this was a very cursory search that I did before this. There are plenty of areas in this neighborhood that we could put a dog park that would be the right size. For example, there's private land, that B of A sign is right there, that's a large space. That Geico lot, it goes largely unused, that parking lot. We can carve out the side at the very end of the block that's, that would be a large size for a dog park. And it would be far from the Little Fall, the, the creek. So you wouldn't have a pollution issue either. Um, there are other areas. There is a, there's a park behind Sushiko that there's a large area of open land there that we could use. There are a lot of spaces. There's Vinton Park. There are a lot of spaces that have gone unexplored. So I'm asking you, we want to work with you. We want a dog park. We don't want a dog park in that space. It's not the right space. It actually fails the Montgomery County's own suitability study. It, it was at the bottom of their list. They only put it here, as you all know, because Norwood Park rejected them. And so they were scrambling to find a place and they dumped it on us. Let's not let them dump it on us. We don't want it here. We want it in our neighborhood. We don't want it in our backyard. We don't want them to ruin that beautiful, beautiful park <clears throat> that people enjoy. So I'm asking you, we, I, I started the petition and Mr. Muller, I will tell you that we created that petition. We did that petition in a week and a half while we were working in the middle of summer and we were able to get 300 signatures in a week and a half. So if we were to spend the adequate amount of time on it, we could easily double or triple that number. And no, they were not all from 4701. There were plenty from 40, there were 40, 4620. There were plenty, there was adequate representation from all the buildings. But again, we only had a week and a half. Give us more time, we'll give you 500. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, of all of these uh, uh, statements that uh, the residents are making are very important, but as you pointed out, we're, we have an order of business for the dog park. Uh, so I'm asking that if others want to speak to the dog park, uh, that they speak during the order. Order. But I think my, I appreciate that, but, but I believe at that point it's the council should be talking about it. I, I, the council should be doing the progress and so forth. Very, very, very good. So, but all right, we just should have to let folks start their city. We'll hear everything about the dog park from the residents now, and then that had to be done. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. And by the way, Mr. Chairman, um, I've been attending meetings here for eight years, and it, it, we rarely ever let uh, people speak beyond three minutes. And I don't think it's fair to those people that have come before 
to not uh, adhere to that structure. For those people that have been attending meetings here for years, thank you. Go ahead, sir. Uh, my name is Tino Colombi. I live on Willard Avenue. I was born in Washington, D.C., and I lived on uh, D.C. Chevy Chase, and I moved here 26 years ago. Uh, let me say that this uh, hall has great memories for me. Uh, I don't know if any of you ever had a daughter whose wedding reception was in this hall, <laughs> but I did. <laughs> and it was wonderful. Uh, I'm not going to take even three minutes. Here is a flyer that I've developed regarding uh, what I call the mini <laughs> park within the park. And I hope you'll consider that as background for your own discussion uh, later on in your program. Uh, let's see. Uh, Dr. Muller, Art? Yes. Oh, sorry, Dr. Muller. <laughs> <laughs> uh, reportedly, you said at one point, where are our dogs going to play? And I'm sure there are other residents of the area who asked the same question, where are our dogs going to play? And of course, uh, the first thing that comes to mind for people who live here who have dogs is, well, in Willow Park Avenue, when they build the dog park. And I will say this, that dogs have always had access to Willard Avenue from sunrise to sunset. They always have had access. Who hasn't had access? There was a person here who had, oh, there's a wheelchair there. I, I have never talked to her, but I wonder if she has enjoyed the Willard Avenue Park. If you go down Willard Avenue, the two entrances are like that. They're very slopey, very downhill. A person with the, a, a walker or anyone else with a ambulatory disability is not going to chance going down there. They're smart. They could either fall down or, in short, the park has not been enjoyed by people with ambulatory disabilities. Dogs have had the choice of being there all the time, okay? What I propose is what you see in the flyer, a mini park within the park build a space that they are trying to put the dog park in, use that space and create this mini park, which would allow access to people with ambulatory disabilities. And that's not just people that you, you know, see normally with uh, wheelchairs or, but the elderly, I'm 87. I can't walk a lot down that part because getting back up is hard but even going down is hard do something about that look at this and wh while you make a decision as to whether you want to put dogs first in terms of that plot or people with ambulatory disabilities in that plot who don't enjoy any access to it now but would under this thank you very much Uh, my name is Upasna Naiman. I live in one of the single family homes on Willard Avenue. Um, and I'm also here today to talk to you about the dog park plan and my perspective. Um, this dog park, as my neighbors mentioned, is at 5320 Willard Avenue. Anyone familiar with this plan, such as all of you, likely know that due to the location of this proposed dog park, the adverse impacts of this plan are concentrated heavily among the homes and apartments right near it or facing it. I find that this decision for this plan has not quite been collaborative and thoughtful regarding the residents who are living nearby and are directly, very negatively impacted by such a proposal. Um, certain people who support this plan, I feel have been advocating only for the subset of residents who are both A, dog owners mm -hmm. and B, do not live in a home negatively impacted by the dog park being in this particular location. I would also like to note that every single single family home on Willard Avenue 
has, uh, including those of dog owners, is against this dog park at 5620 Willard or in the Willard Park, Willard Avenue Park, as are also several or hundreds of neighbors living in 4701 Willard or Willard Towers, 4620 North Park, 4615 North Park, the Carlton, the Willoughby, as well as other residents of Friendship Heights. Um, I ask humbly that the Village Council consider these extremely negative impacts that a dog park on Willard Avenue or at 5620 Willard would have on the, the surrounding neighbors and recall your request for this proposal to the park staff of Montgomery County. I also humbly ask that you support me and my neighbors in requesting the county that instead of uh, the needs of just one very particular subset of residents, that we work towards finding ways for all constituents, most notably our elderly residents who live in Friendship Heights, to be able to enjoy this space. These elderly residents are unable to enjoy the, the peaceful, serene, wooded park at this moment due to, as my other neighbor mentioned, the steep slopes that they are unable to access by walkers and wheelchairs. We would like to uh, request that budgets maybe be used for um, efforts on a community, community garden or made accessible for those with walkers or wheelchairs. And this garden has also been identified as one of the top requests um, in several surveys, the same surveys where Montgomery Parks found that a dog park was required. Thank you very much for your time. Absolutely not. No, I'll be, I will be. I will be very brief because I have nothing to contribute to the main topic of discussion tonight, except you don't want to talk this stuff. But I do, I do have a broader observation, which is relevant. And somehow, listening to this conversation and listening to other conversations, um, the process somehow seems to me to have gotten upside down. Um, before the county decided a dog park should be built in this neighborhood or anything in this neighborhood, they should have approached the, the council ahead of time to get input and make a decision on this. It doesn't, you know, this is not, it seems to me to be a series of examples where the county makes a decision and dumps it on Friendship Heights. So I, I think, uh, I don't know what the solution is. It's the, uh, you, you, anybody knows anything about the county knows that this would never happen in Tacoma Park. They would ask the, the people and the council, Tacoma Park, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think before they would do anything? And they owe the same courtesy to the people in Friendship Heights and to the Friendship Heights Council too. So I don't know what the answer is. It's a political answer, but somehow, <laughs> You guys can be at the front of the line, not the back of the line, when it comes to well, killing decisions around. I think it's because I indicated before we were having this fully discussed and uh, a little, little bit later on the agenda. Well, let me just make a few a few points, a few points, and then the council has to move on to its business. Yeah. But first, uh, I, I assume everybody understands that that the Willow Avenue Park is not within the jurisdiction of Friendship by Storage. That we have no money involved with, with that park, that all the decisions about the park is just made by a parks department, Montgomery County Parks Department, not by us. Uh, we were the, the, well, this gets a bit more into the history, but members of this council and this community have for many years been petitioning uh, Montgomery County Parks. For to do something with that particular piece of land that was bought by Parks 19 years ago, it was promised to be added to Willard Abbey Park, and we have we have uh, we have urged them to do that. We test I testified personally before the uh, the uh, county council asking them to do that. We've talked with them uh, about doing that. And the answer has been a resounding no. Each time there's not enough money, we don't care about this, we don't have the time, we don't have the money, we're not interested. Uh, so, you know, we'll, 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 we'll air this fully at a later point, but, uh, but this, has been, this has been not a brand new thing. This is something that the council has been involved in for some time. Let's go on to, uh, if there are no other comments, uh, 
I assume people participating, Jason. I, I've heard that they can't hear and they can't get involved. And, uh, I tested in my office. I was able to hear. Yeah. So I'm not sure. Manuel, Man, can you hear us? They can't hear. They can't hear. Mr. Chairman, I so Mr. Chairman, I'd like to recommend uh, to work to those people to have their say. Um, why don't we allow those people to uh, have their say at the start of the uh, order of business, and then we'll follow them. It, yes. Sir, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, is that way? Right. We give them an opportunity if they want to uh, stick around and have a say. Presumably, there is there is doubt from the chamber. Yeah, in this case, but we can get in touch. That's fine. We, yeah. yeah. No, 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 yeah. I think it's racist hand. Let's just spit it out. Mayor Spencer's. I, I, because I'll have some questions and comments for uh, a number of the folks that have uh, made comments this evening. I sure hope you will stick around until we have the full, uh, the full uh, the order of business. Speak more. If we all got together and did so at a different time, so that's that, no, that's not appropriate. Okay. We have to have open meetings. Go ahead, Charlie. This is an announcement regarding the Village Council settlement agreement <laughs> with the 5500 Wisconsin Avenue developer. On August 26, the circuit court ruled against the village in its appeal of the planning board's approval of the sketch plan for 5500 Wisconsin Avenue. On September 2, the village signed a settlement agreement regarding the 5500 Wisconsin Avenue project. Under this agreement, the village will drop its opposition, including no longer appealing the court decision, and will support the project. The agreement requires some changes that the village requested in the original plans, such as relocating the apartment building's entrance from the corner of South Park and Hills Plaza to the private street, providing vehicle pickup and drop-off spaces in front of the lobby entrance on the private street, and providing parking spaces for delivery vehicles on that street. The developer will pay the village $1 million for the village is transferring to the Wisconsin Avenue project up to 32,718 square feet of density from the village's recently purchased Red House property. The density transfer will be used principally to widen the seventh floor of the Wisconsin Avenue building to be about the same size as the first six floors. The density transfer will not increase the height of the building. It is anticipated that an above ground building construction permit will be issued within two years with demolition of the existing building and ground construction commencing before then. Okay. Is it Mr. Chair, uh, comments from members of the council? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as many of you know, there was a, a break-in at the uh, Gourmet Market last Thursday. Um, and for those that don't know, uh, it occurred at 2.30 in the morning. Um, the alarm uh, went, uh, went off. Um, however, it did not get sent to the police. We don't know why. It's maintained by the owners of the building, of the, of the gourmet market. Uh, the two individuals were masks. Uh, they had gloves. They took the safe. Uh, they were not able to get the ATM. Uh, the internal cameras uh, uh, were able to document, but couldn't identify the people. The, uh, the Carlton's uh, cameras uh, were able to identify at least part of the uh, of the getaway car, and we're hopeful that they will be apprehended. Um, the uh, uh, the council has previously done a very thorough study. Um, the staff has looked into the possibility of having uh, uh, surveillance cameras. We do have two that are in the park. Uh, however, there is a technical issue on how far 
and was uh, in project and where monitors can go and whether 24 seven is required. Um, I will suggest to my colleagues that one thing that has not been explored, which the manager can explore now, uh, is to see whether or not with the present police substation, which is both close to 4620 and also fairly close to the gourmet market, there might be some way that uh, monitors and um, uh, surveillance a camera could be connected. I don't know if that's possible, uh, but I can assure everyone that everyone on this council is just as frustrated as our neighbors. There is no easy solution to criminals, especially ones that seem to be professional. And it wasn't just a, a grab and, and, and break in. And they didn't take any of the wine. <laughs> they missed all the good stuff. So I, I, I do ask the manager to see if there are alternatives that, that might increase uh, security by coordinating with the police that uh, are sometimes there at least. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments from the council? Uh, Bruce? Mr. Chairman, a very brief comment. Uh, I was instrumental in doing the study to which uh, my colleague uh, produced. As a part of that work, we did a, a fairly elaborate survey of all the existing cameras in the building. You notice that in this particular instance, it was the camera that Carlton caught the license plate. That camera was deliberately set above the door uh, to, the, to the Carlton, even across the street, so it gave a fairly wide swath of uh, North Park Avenue and uh, part of the Elizabeth uh, and to the uh, Virgin Heights Grove Navy. Now, it strikes me that if we wish to increase surveillance of the village, partnership with the buildings, not the cameras on the buildings, might be the best, the most practical, the most effective way of doing it. I just want to mention that because there has been some uh, suggestion that the village itself should put surveillance for owners plus fire breath. I'm not sure that's the best way to do it. Chairman, thank you. Mm -hmm. Chairman, uh, <clears throat> yes, follow up. Uh, I, a lot of residents have seemed to be, you know, rightfully so, some, you know, crime that we've had, had and are somewhat shocked by it. Um, I, I am not shocked by it. Um, this is a very, um, a very wealthy community. And when John Dillinger was asked why he was robbing banks, he said it's because that's where the money is. And so for the residents in, in here tonight and on the Zoom, I think you need to recognize that the crime in the District of Columbia is going to spill out across the line. And certainly, I believe the main attraction for the uh, market was the ATM machine. That's what they really wanted. That's where the money's at. And as long as they have that ATM machine in there, these were professionals. They came with masks, they knew what they wanted to do, and they weren't able to get into the ATM. Now, I stopped by the market and spoke to a lady that works in there um, daily and asked her if, they, you know, if there were uh, security cameras outside. She said, yes, I couldn't. I couldn't see any on the building. In fact, one of the men that works there went out and he looked and he didn't see any. Uh, she told me that um, she, she had spoken. I said, I asked her, who do you pay your rent to? And she said, CBRE. I said, I wouldn't pay my rent if they weren't providing a safe place for me to operate my business. And she said that CBRE told them that it was the village's responsibility uh, to, to monitor and protect the businesses. Now, I won't do everything possible to protect the, all our residents and all the business, businesses, but they are a for-profit organization. And I think at the very least, they should be able to provide some security cameras for a market that's being hit routinely. And, uh, she didn't even have the contact name and telephone number for CBRE, so I went into their main um, foyer there 
And I took a picture of the uh, CBRE's uh, contact telephone number. I didn't have time to call them today, but I, I think we need to sit down with CBRE and find out why they're not doing anything to help protect the business that they're making money on. And it'll, it'll help all of us in the long run. So that, that's what I think we should do. Thank you. Any further comments for you, Martin? Okay. So, uh, uh, Secretary's reports. I'll get a whole bunch of developments. What's more proper? I want to do my best. This is Jeremy. Uh, the draft of minutes for July 11th, the uh, public session, July 11th, 2022, were distributed. I received no corrections. I nor could they be accepted as. Uh, as distributed for a second. All those in favor? Aye. The, the draft of executive session minutes for July 11th that were distributed. Essentially, it was uh, discussions about the the, uh, the negotiations for the Red House, 4608 North, and also the staff salaries. Uh, Distributed uh, and no corrections. I move that those be accepted as distributed. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The draft minutes of the public session of July 21st were distributed uh, and no corrections were received. I move that those be accepted as distributed. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, the closed session minutes of July 28th were distributed. These uh, were discussing the uh, uh, contractual negotiations between FHNN and the Village Council. And we will discuss those later, but the minutes uh, were distributed without any corrections received. I move that those minutes be accepted as distributed. Those in favor? All seconds, all in favor. All right. All right. The, the closed session minutes of August 8th uh, discussed uh, 5500 uh, Wisconsin Avenue development in, in great detail. Uh, there were no corrections received, and I move that they be uh, accepted as distributed. All seconds. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The uh, confidential uh, minutes of August 16th uh, were distributed. These discussed again uh, negotiations for 5,500 development. Uh, they were uh, distributed uh, and no corrections were received. I move that both be accepted as distributed. Who seconds it? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. The confidential minutes of August 25th were distributed. These also discussed the privilege negotiations, which have been eventually discussed uh, for 5500 Wisconsin Avenue. There were no corrections and moved that they be accepted as distributed. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And finally, I hope <laughs> the, uh, the minutes, public minutes of August 25th were distributed. There were no corrections that I received. Uh, all of these things have been reviewed both by the secretary and by management. Um, I move that they be accepted as distributed. Uh, <coughs> second, Mr. Rose, in favor? Aye. 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 Very quickly. For those of you who have only posted on the website, approved uh, as soon as we can get to a computer that works. <laughs> For those of you who are new to our meetings, we, we don't usually have as many closed sessions as this is indicated here in all of these minutes, but we're dealing with a complex issue in regards to bargaining uh, negotiation on the project and, and negotiating on the sale of the Red House, two very major issues before the council, all of which, according to the rules uh, that we operate under, um, have to be uh, at least talk about them, uh, the executives. President's report, Paul. Thank you. All figures are as of July 31st, 2022. In the general fund, total cash on hand was 
thousand. Twelve dollars and nine cents. In the capital improvements fund, eleven thousand three hundred twenty dollars and ninety six cents. In the OPEB trust fund reserve, one thousand three hundred thirty seven dollars and sixty five cents. Questions? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I'm looking at the uh, profit and loss uh, statement for July uh, twenty twenty two, and under uh, interest income. I, I would like a just a uh, tell me uh, could be explained to me uh, the selected period of three thousand five ten the budgeted for eight thirty three the difference being two thousand six hundred and seventy seven thereabouts is that is that minus or plus the difference which uh, which item was that uh, July 2022, um, under interest income, under revenues, under interest income. I believe that's plus. That's, that, that's, that's, that's plus. plus. Okay. Okay. So, uh, you budgeted for 830, 833 this year, uh, this July, and you took in 3510 and that's a, a, a plus of 2,677 over what you budgeted for. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mark. Uh, committee reports, uh, uh, Council Committee on Concierge and Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will read a statement that will be uh, included in the record and which will be posted. Um, the suggestion of a village sponsored concierge service was first raised at the May 2021 public council meeting. In the ensuing year, there was ongoing investigation of various options, including the grant or subsidy OGNN, a contract with some nonprofit, or retaining the status quo without implementing any changes. On May 9th, 2022, after public notification for nonprofit organizations to express their interest in providing such a service, which had been renamed Neighbors Help and Enhanced Program Opportunities open to all Friendship Heights residents, the council received two applicants. They selected each NN as the preferred candidate with which to initiate contractual negotiation. Excuse me. A negotiating team was appointed by Mayor White at the June 21st, 2022 public council meeting. This negotiating team consisted of Mayor White, Vice Chair Kearney, and Secretary Mullen. The negotiating team met in executive session on July 28, 2022, with FHM President Connie Brown and Vice President Treasurer Evan Smith, and reiterated the council's full support of FHNN's vision and five years of important work. The council's negotiating team reiterated their two main goals. One, to reduce the current multi-hundred dollar membership fees to $50. And two, to advertise and make available to all Friendship Heights residents the excellent programs presently offered by FHNN. The council's overall philosophy was more amenities for more residents at less cost. They also pledged an active solicitation via the village newsletter for new volunteers to provide these services who would be vetted by FHNN. The council team proposed a three-year renewable contract with a six-month cancellation by either party. This would allow both parties time to restructure their organization if there were a cancellation. The council made clear, the council negotiating team made clear that it could not make commitments that would be binding on future councils via a contract or a grant or subsidy. Without such a commitment, FHNN was unable at this time to agree to a contract. The meeting was cordial and candid, but resolution was not possible at this time. Thank you, Rob. Thank you to the committee. Committee advisory committee. Jeremy. Um, 
Uh, Joe, yeah, so the first, the first, the uh, August 10th committee, um, it was led by the chair, Joe Boucher, um, was held by Zoom. Um, the several village residents were in attendance. Um, and the committee voted to approve the release of its document titled Report on Enhancing Identity of the Village and Friendship Heights. Um, there was a discussion um, um, by residents uh, regarding uh, the pending decision to purchase the property at 4608. Um, the committee opted to hear the concern under the premise of a process discussion and did not in the direction of the committee chair consider pros and cons of the pending purchase. The committee recognized that the village council has the authority to consider such actions. Um, the resident heard the committee heard resident concerns and discussed the merits of improving opportunity for community communication with major purchases or similar decision. There was further discussion by residents uh, uh, that wish to review the inspection reports, the facts regarding the purchase and any contingency language. Excuse me, that was a residents uh, who were guests of the committee. Um, several committee members and residents <laughs> expressed concern about the perception that executive sessions of the council make it seem that decisions are not made in public. After hearing the discussion, the committee voted to request the village council do more than post on the bulletin board and website that meetings are occurring, especially where there is a need to elicit public comments on major decisions. Such efforts would be to issue a request to the management of village buildings to post such meetings via their internal bulletin boards and electronic communication methods. Um, the uh, residents attending were Clara uh, Lovett, uh, Dan Dossier, and Robert was strong. Um, the uh, community advisory met on September 7th uh, last week, um, and um, the meeting was held here live. Um, there was continued concern about the bus schedule for 4615 and Willard Towers, which has been reduced. There was concern among some residents about noise from the proposed broadcast. I think we heard that tonight. Uh, the Willoughby is in the voting process on a smoke free uh, resolution. Um, there was concern about cleanliness and maintenance of the metro entrance through the parking garage by Boots. There was discussion of the status of the proposed dog park. Uh, there was a brief overview of the webinar of a webinar regarding. Um, electric car charging installation. Um, there was interest in having minutes of the committee meetings and its reports available to the public via the village website. And um, the managers, uh, Julian and Jason, um, have added a link for the CCC so you can read the minutes on the village website, which has been upgraded uh, thanks to a lot of work by the committee members, uh, especially Councilwoman Sumar Jones and uh, the assistant manager. The committee discussed and voted unanimously to engage in community discussion via a survey and meetings regarding use for the Red House once the transaction is closed. And they're, they're interested in making a tour of the building once it's, it's a village property. And uh, uh, Julian has reached out to the property manager in charge of the Metro entrance by the Old Foods, and I believe uh, Chairman Butchra is going to give a now a detailed report of the committee on the concept of community. Thank you, Jim. Council members, good evening. Um, I realize that it's getting late, so I have um, gone through what I was going to say with a pen. I'd ask uh, Mr. Chairman to consent if I could send that through to uh, Julian and have it posted as part of your minutes, the full document. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, the Village of Friendship Heights, as we all know, is a culturally diverse, quiet, high-rise community of approximately 5,000 residents. As part of its 2021-2022 activity, the Community Advisory Committee, or CAC, considered the issue of identity as it related to the Village of Friendship Heights. 
there are several reasons to undertake this initiative. First, to establish a sense of place. Second, for the reasons of marketing and communication. The full report that council members receive represents about a year's worth of work, research, discussion, and compromise amongst the entire committee. Um, in my documents that I'll send through, I outline the names of the committee members. Um, the committee has focused on suggestions to increase awareness of being in the village of Friendship Heights. The village community is different from Bethesda, Somerset, and DC Friendship Heights. In fact, during recent Business Alliance focus groups and surveys, as well as a meeting that it held with the CAC, when the Heights was discussed, we questioned what they meant by that. Outlining the differences between the village and surrounding areas seem to be important. We believe that it is in the village's interest to define itself given the development activity surrounding it. Identity is first connected to having a sense of place. The village has a recognizable village center and Humphrey Park, which serve as the center of the community. These are augmented by Willoughby Park and Page Park. These help as place identifiers, but is it recognizable as being a village unto itself? There is a physical aspect to identity. It's about letting people know where they are. Signs and markers are important, but so too is branding and marketing. If you were a first time visitor to the, to the village, would you actually know that you were in the village of Friendship Heights? There are no visible markers, signs, or other materials to let you know. There are also frequent disagreements about what the boundaries of the village are. And we've heard a lot of that tonight. In contrast, nearby communities such as Drummond, Somerset, and Chevy Chase West have signage to let people know where they are. Examples were in the larger document that you received in your packet. This is especially important in 2022 as Montgomery County and DC plan a revitalization of the Heights at the crossroads of Bethesda and DC. Signage welcoming people to the village in addition to modestly bolder signage on the village sponsored shuttle bus are important to letting people know where they are and to begin to provide a sense of physical place. Beyond physical place, there often needs to be an emotional connection. Place identity is often tied to a common purpose, such as a sense of well being, safety, and other attributes. The village already has an infrastructure in place to help begin its marketing. We recommend being taking advantage of our assets. One, take advantage and enhance walkability by completing the test of lighted pedestrian safety signs and speed humps and incorporate them in a few locations previously outlined by the committee to reinforce this important and frequently cited aspect of village life. Two, emphasize the village center and Humphrey Park as the center of town. Enhance the signage. While there are space limitations, there is room for improvement in the area assigned to the village bulletin board at the corner of Humphrey Park. Rather than have a bulletin board that is difficult to read, have a landmark sign welcoming people to the village. We are cognizant that there is a risk of too much signage in a small area that would lead to the village having a cluttered look. Additionally, we recommend replacing the bulletin board with a digital sign that could be placed in the left as you face the village center entrance window of the village center. This would serve several purposes. First, it would facilitate updates in a more timely manner. Secondly, it would potentially draw more residents to the village center and encourage them to enter. Improve signage for the parks in the village. Incorporate signage like those at County Park, stating maintained by the Village of Friendship Heights. Enhance signage on the village shuttle. More vibrant and bolder colors Currently, the white on white is lost when it's in motion and it's extremely hard to read. Seniors are the largest and most stable cohort in the village. The village should continue the conversation to provide services so that if they choose, they can age in their own apartment homes and continue to be a vibrant part of the community. So too, children and families are important to the community. When children get together, their parents tend to meet other parents and get involved in activities. Many children's events occur at daytime hours when parents are working. While evenings are difficult due to dinner and homework, having kids events on weekends could be beneficial to incorporate families more fully in the life of the village. Interest parents in possibly becoming more active 
and providing an avenue for demographic diversity. On weekends, consider expanding the shuttle bus to drop off at Willow, Willow Park. As the closest play area, parents of small children are required to walk up and down the hill on Willard with strollers and other necessities. Use the weekly farmer's market to continue to promote village sponsored events beyond the website and the newsletter. This can be done by having community group tables, marketing materials, and representatives of the village or village groups available to answer questions of residents. Possibly select one Saturday a month for this presence. The Business Alliance has started to sponsor events and is beginning to proactively advertise them well in advance of event dates. Coordinate with the Alliance to grow the voice and identity of village in the area, as well as to influence activities of interest to village residents. None of these recommendations that we made come at extreme cost. They represent easily achievable items. And I'll just as a reminder, one of the reasons the council voted to approve the village suits purchase of, of the red building with a compromise on 5500 Wisconsin was to invest in the village and its continuing identity. Our recommendations dovetail with this intent. The effort to enhance identity is not a short-term effort that will require time to develop, but with some steps we feel will be a benefit in expanding the identity of the village as a place to live for all ages and to be known for its inclusiveness and lead to greater activity among residents. And the committee, the advisory committee expects to continue to be involved in this effort. I don't know if there are questions. No. Thank you, George. And thanks to, to the committee. It's a very comprehensive statement. Um, I'll turn to the council in just a moment, but I would, I would my suggestion would be that the question of the infrastructure parts of the proposal, we have a committee charge the committee, our infrastructure committee uh, to uh, to look at those sorts of things. And the program committee that we do have to, uh, should be looking at some of the new programs that, that are that could be designed to uh, serve younger families. John. There is, yeah, I agree with just about everything that uh, Joe proposed. I'd like to see a nice big sign out there on Cot Corner. We do intend to put up more of those <clears throat> large pedestrian warning signs, uh, perhaps solar power. We've had a good experience with the one that we put up in the corner there. Uh, I particularly like the suggestion of the bus because the bus is a great way to advertise the village, assuming that it's running. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we're and we're missing in that opportunity. It's on the agenda. I just took some things, Joe. You got a big color picture here, an old sign, right? And the uh, a big beautiful new sign. It's a part of the contract, but it's the last thing, not the last first thing we put on the part. This, this uh, by the way, I think we'll put it on a boulder rather than a column. Be more in keeping with the like, nature. Of like, the, like, like I said, the, the the signage. Somebody respond to that. The signage can, needs to be consistent throughout the village. You have two parks on each end. They tie each other together. The signage needs to be consistent as opposed to that little thing we had introducing. It's in the contract, Joe. Sure. I, I know it's in the contract, but remember, we've been writing this for a year. <laughs> so, Well, the next thing we do is we build the hard stand. And then after that, we start the plant. And when we get to the end, we'll put the damn sign. All right. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the report. It's detailed, and what I find of value is that essentially for us, it's a checklist of the things that we need to do because um, I agree with it 100%. So, and they're not costly, the suggestions are not costly, but I think this is a very, very important document. Checklist, and we can get started. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Joe, um, it's fabulous work here. And you put a lot of effort into it. Right the you know, committee. Um, um, I, you know, I, you just, this, is, this is just really well done. I, I do, however, want to point out to you uh, one, I share your, certainly uh, your, <coughs> your part here. I read this whole thing. Enhancing this language. Um, 
I do want to let you know, the residents know that about four years ago, this issue was brought up by the Community Advisory Committee. And that was, I guess, the dark ages of the council. <laughs> no money was being spent on anything. That's why we have $6 million. But you point out Somerset and Dorset and West Chevy Chase. That is exactly what the committee four years ago was promoting, and it went nowhere. So I thank you for taking this effort. Again, the digital sign that you mentioned, we brought that up four years ago. And again, no interest in spending any money on something that takes us into the 21st century. We have a new court board speaker. Um, I just want the residents to know that these issues, most of these, have been brought before us before and went nowhere. I'm hoping that this council, there's some new members from here, you may have enough to get some of these things done. And you have my full support. Um, it couldn't be better. This work you've done is tremendous. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was and still am the liaison to the committee, and I had nothing to do with the report. I want everybody to know this is uh, an independent group. Um, they don't always agree with every council member. The report, though, is, as everyone has said, is excellent. I would like to recognize there are two other members here, uh, Cameron Moody. Give a wave out and Evan Smith. Uh, uh, and we have about eight or nine people, and they all have worked very hard on this. Um, so all of their names are, are yes. here, but for time, I would. Yeah. Joe, I'll, I'll, Joe, thank you very much because you have been a coordinator for our excellence. Um, now that we're done with the briefly mentioned the website. So I think it would really be important to um, get some feedback on how the website is working for you. If you, that's, that is to say for the community, if you have any thoughts, any suggestions, as to how good work here to listen to them, because essentially that's one easy way to communicate with, with the community. So we're ready to hear your Without any tweaks, let us know. Thank you. No Thank you, Joe, for your report. Uh, I, I did notice one item that I, um, is already in place on weekends. Consider expanding the shuttle bus to drop off at Willard Park. Right now, the shuttle bus, it, as part of its normal schedule, drops, picks up and drops off right in front of the south entrance to the Willoughby. And because they normally cannot enter that driveway, it's normally right on the sidewalk, which is practically in Willard Park. A little bit further down to the entrance. It, if it's available. It's very, not, very not not the entrance on River. <coughs> the entrance pull down past the Willoughby to past Fourth Street to, to the entrance to the park that's on Willoughby. Uh, yeah, that's okay. what, because okay. there's yeah. parking there. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Speaking of buses. Uh, the next uh, next uh, item is discussion of the city's shuttle bus service. Uh, Curie, do you want to start with this, and then we can. Uh, um, yeah, we'll start very briefly, and I'm, I'm actually I think I'm going to hand the microphone over to Art um, to make sure everybody can hear it. But Art Meisner is here, who's our vice president of RMA. RMA is our bus contractor and has been for many years. Uh, Art's been working with us. For the whole time, um, through numerous contracts, mm -hmm. contracts, I think it's been about 15 years. So, we have had some recent challenges with the buses keeping them up. So, Art is here to give us some hope and answer questions. Thank you, Julie. And it's good to be with you again this evening. Um, always appreciate talking to the council. And I know it's a topic of discussion that we've had some challenges with the buses that have been running. And I'm here to answer any questions, but maybe kind of give you a little bit of a, a state of affairs and where we're at right now and, and uh, what we plan on doing about it. And as you know, um, it was a couple of years ago, the council was very smart to approve 
two big vehicles at the time. And it's a good thing because as we know, the, the, the pandemic really did, you know, has had a lot of hardships on all of us in many, many ways, but it's the Lennox. I mean, the, the problem that we're having right now is getting close. Right now, there's a shortage of, of labor and there's a, a shortage of supply. Uh, in, in, in addition to that, the, um, the, the delivery of parts for these champion buses would take a little, a little bit longer. Believe it or not, Champion went out of business in 2021, about a year ago. So they're not even around anymore. Lots of changes have taken place because of these, you know, pandemic issues that, that we're facing. Uh, and so getting parts now are taking weeks as opposed to days. That's where we're kind of really, you know, a little bit of a, a hardship. Um, but we're getting that. Uh, just to give you a little example, the two of the buses that are on route, the one of them is 4001, been on route now for the past week again. It seems to be doing very well. I just sort of buy it. It's nice. And we hope that's going to stay in, in force for a while um, as we get 4002 back up. 4002, unfortunately, July 31st, ended up with a broken axle. Well, a broken axle is not something you can just order and get in five days like we used to be able to get it. It's a whole process. Uh, it's at Colonial right now, waiting for repair. We're, we're, we're hoping that this gets done sooner than later. All of the parts are in except for a bracket that actually has to be molded and created and made. It just doesn't exist someplace. So it's being created now, and we hope we pray that it will be with us in the next three weeks. So it's going to be down for at least another three weeks, maybe sooner. One of the buses that you know is running and, and it's, it's doing quite fine. So I, I understand that this is a you know, major hardship. It's a super inconvenience for everybody, not just the council, but the village, of, the village residents as well. And we're we're very concerned and we're very you know, we care that, that you know, we're trying to do the best that we can under these circumstances. Um, at some point, we're going to talk about once these, these buses have been in service now for two years, the first two years, I really, you know, I can think of maybe one or two times where one of the buses wasn't available for a day or two at max, but we, we've done very well. I think we just it's an unfortunate situation what's happened in the last month, six weeks. But we're working quickly to get these problems solved. Um, I think the future, just so that everybody realizes, I think when these vehicles depreciate, um, we'll be talking very closely with Julie and Jason about what's next. And what's next is electrified. Um, I think we're probably a couple of years away from that happening. But that's the future. Uh, once that happens, all the combustion engine, all the noise, all the diesel, it all goes away. And then all these you know, various parts that are going down are challenges. But they don't exist anymore. So, you know, you get some charging stations uh, in the back in our office, maybe one here in the village we had talked about. It's, it's, it's something that might be open for discussion council at some point. Once these vehicles start to depreciate a little bit, and then we can talk about them. making the technology much better every day. The battery technology is really improving quickly, uh, and the prices are starting to go down. They're very expensive. Um, so uh, again, you know, I'm, I'm was very sympathetic to, to what's taking place right now. But we're doing everything we can as quickly as we can to have these buses both operation at the same time. And I'm open to any questions. You questions from the council? Go ahead, Charlie, and we'll move through. Paul? I have a question. Sure. Um, was it two years ago that we, um, you showed us these new vehicles? Yes. Um, three. three years ago. I remember that it's, it's when you showed 
Yes. The vehicles and told us about the merits of these vehicles. Will these vehicles have such a short lifespan? The years is all they last. There's, there's a difference between the, the old transit vehicles that we used to have. They were, for the most part, a nine or a ten year vehicle. They were also quite expensive, and when they went down, the time down was a long time. The 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 uh, the idea here, which Council Cook and I still will tell you, I think it was, it was brilliant because without it, we'd be back to one transit vehicle still. And when it goes down, it's down, and now we don't have anything to back it up. So at least we have these vehicles. Right now, we just happen to be down at the same time for a short period of time, but it's not going to stay that way. Um, and, and the price of the two is the same as one transit vehicle, as they recall. So I, I still think the strategy of getting the two was, was, was very smart to do. Uh, I think in the long run, it, it's, it's really helped out because, like I said, if we were down to one, and then when it goes down, it would be more. Let's just make that. And I don't want to be particularly aggressive. It's just that I'm saying oh, no. that if these, if these buses, and were they you were used, or were they new? Oh, okay. right. So, Brand new three years ago, and they're now dysfunctional. Is that what I'm saying? I wouldn't say that they're dysfunctional. I would say that we have um, they need to make parts. They do, yes, like anybody does. I mean, it doesn't go back. So, this is more as a, as a, I don't know about my colleagues, but I particularly have a sour taste in my mouth because if I were to buy a car. And after three years, the car would have so many problems, I would have issues with the dealer. So, um, I mean, I think you can, you can understand that. Yeah. And then now we're, you're recommending that as soon as the um, EVs are available, that would be um, the route to go. But again, um, we may be facing the same thing all over again. So. I mean, yes. Please tell us. No, I mean, yes, but you know, larger bus. They they constantly have to be maintained. They constantly have to be um, parts going to go down. They're running eighteen hours a day, seven days a week. They are going to not hold up the same way as a as a as an automobile to hold up. It's expected then. There will be some downtime. That's the reason why we got a two. Didn't expect the both of them to be down at the same time because an accident broke on one. Okay. I'm, I'm still not quite sure how that happened, but it did. And so, you know, the idea of having two, and I still will say this, and I'm certain of it, once the other one is back up, one will always be failed. This is just an unusual circumstance over the past five weeks. And, uh, and now we have one of them back up. So I I don't foresee that being the case for the long run. I think for the most part, uh, I think the residents can tell us that you know the, the buses are nice. They run really well when they're on the road, and you know. The other thing, my follow up question mm -hmm. to you is: sure. um, Can you supply us with? State of the art or better buses while well, these two buses are out. We have other ADA vehicles, but they're not low floor. And that's the reason why we have purchased these for the village. Uh, if we had other low floor ADA vehicles, yes, we put them in services back us and, and what we stand. So something to consider downstream. But I, again, I would. Say to you that within the next two or three weeks, this won't be an issue anymore. And I hope that this bus, I believe this bus, is in good condition to stay on the route until the other backup is there. Because the piece that we are substantial, and I've seen it in, in our um, in our budget here, we're paying how much monthly for buses? Julian, am I right? Forty thousand dollars. $40,000 a month. For $40,000 a month, 
we I sympathize with your problems as a small business person. Believe me, I do. I do. I understand what you're facing. But $40,000 a month. We want buses, replacement buses. If you don't have a real ones or good ones, we want replacement buses that work and that provide services. Because I don't think we're second hand, you know, uh, planes. No, you know, you're not, not, you're, not you, but your enterprise needs to do better. I hear you. I really appreciate that. And we are working as quickly as we can to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, I have uh, specific questions from constituent. Um, does RMA use the same quote unquote repair shop for its schedule as it does for the buses of the village council? If so, do RMA's vehicles get preference over those of the village council? I don't, I'm not sure what the village council is using it for repairs. What's the name? I'm not sure. I'm I think our other line of vehicles compared with the ones that are, that, that, that are you do have other buses beyond. Yes. Beyond this. So the question is whether the ones used by the village are, is there any priority that they break down compared to when buses for other routes are going to We have a them. number of vendors use um and and again we're in post-pandemic times please try to if you can bear with me for a minute what's happening right now is that parts are taking weeks and weeks to, to be delivered it's it, it's just everything is on a backlog so all of these uh repair facilities uh not just in montgomery county that's why we have a number of them because we need to but they have buses backed up and backed up not just from RMA, but from other vendors and from other you know, transportation companies that they're trying to get parts for and get them out. So we have to have a number of them. So, I mean, this, yeah. just to clarify, well, you just so we all understand, you, you yourselves don't, you could, don't repair the buses. Uh, you have to you send it to somebody else. We do, um, but we'll, we'll do general maintenance. Um, but when a bus has to get into the air, it's requiring larger facilities that do this. Yes. Go ahead. Paul, I'm going to hear your mind is this. If a village council bus goes down, mm -hmm. is it repaired immediately, even if the, the second bus is operating? So that there is always a village council bus ready to go into operation. We always have a backup bus. It's not the ideal bus for the village. That's why we have two below four vehicles. We have we, we have never not operated. That's never happened. We've always had something new. It's the type of vehicle that you need that what we're you know working on most. And to answer your question again. We get we get vehicles in the shop immediately, and we're just waiting and waiting and waiting. We don't like it at all. Believe me, it's not in our best interest not to have these two buses in operation, because then we're getting into a third or even a fourth, and it gets very costly. Because we talked about costs, costs way way high between the fuel, the drivers now, and it's it's a tough environment to be in at the moment. So I'm not I'm not. You know, as we present at the year in any way, I understand we're sympathetic, believe me, because we care very much about, um, you know, Friendship Match Village and, and all of the rest of us. We've been doing this for 15 years. I think we've done a relatively good job over the years, considering, you know, certain challenges that we've been facing. Well, this particular question has been the hardest of all because of the pandemic and what's available to us and shortage of drivers and parts and so forth. So well, go ahead. Just go ahead. answer your last one. Sure. He's a grown person, he's a very good client in the last um, and he's he's very concerned. Mm -hmm. So and this is very faint. RMA is contractually obliged to supply a bus in the event 
there are no village council buses available. How many ADA compliant buses does RMA have available? Why were there no ADA compliant buses available to the village for weeks on end while the village council buses were not operating? We did have ADA buses here. Okay. There were some times where I know we had the normal van terrors out, but we did try to introduce some ADA vehicles. Problem is they were lift vehicles, they were not all four. So they were compliant in terms of county, but they weren't um they weren't appropriate for for the for the uh, residents here. Right, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um Two things. I wish I had asked this question three years ago. I didn't. I, I don't. Um, do you keep a law for the daily use of the mileage on the buses for each shift? Of course. You do. Yeah. And each driver logs in and logs out with the mileage at the end of their shifts. I wouldn't say that it's done on a daily basis, but it's done on a uh, more like more monthly basis based on the uh, the um, maintenance that needs to be done. So, yeah. uh, it seems to me the uh, most uh, carding companies, trucking companies, and so forth use a daily log so they know exactly who's driving the bus where. Oh, we know we have a software system knowing exactly who's in the bus. What they've done. Well, given that, um, do you have a process for staggering the use of our buses? Yes. For example, do you use O1 for two weeks and O2 for two weeks? Generally, what we, we have done is use one in the morning, then that shifts. So let's drive the Well, I, I ask that question because it seems to me that if you staggered them, you know, for example, every two weeks, that one bus wouldn't log, both buses wouldn't be logging the same amount of mileage at the same time and run the risk of having a failure. That one would maybe have two weeks left in it when the other bus went down. So in this case, apparently both of them go down at the same time. It just seems to me to make sense that if you staggered them in a larger interval, and their gas engines are not diesel, so they don't have to run all the time, that we wouldn't run into this situation where we're out of both buses at the same time. And the final question I have is, whose bus are we using when we don't have our buses to use? The ones that are running around the village now, whose bus is that? Is that yours? Yes. You, just have, you just keep buses in reserve. We do. Or we may reallocate something. Yes. When you say reallocate, when you there are uh, chartered buses that we have in service. Okay. And so they may not be on a particular shuttle route, but they may be on uh, other type of charter service. And these are buses that you own? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, but you see my point in terms of the staggering? I do. I mean, this, I, 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 I take the point. I mean, something to consider is different. Uh, the idea was to uh, not overtax one as opposed to another. And the way to do that is just to uh, just have one on the morning, one on the afternoon, and spread it out. So there's, there's just two different ways to look at that. And then one, they're scheduled for preventive maintenance. Uh, one maybe go down so that one will stay on the route for, say, two days while the other one is, is in for preventive maintenance. So there's two ways to look at it. But that's an interesting thought, and I'll, well, we'll give that some consideration. I'm sorry, Bruce. Yeah, I understand. Uh, champion has gone out of business. Uh, I, I presume the building on the basis of a of a vehicle manufactured by another firm. To refresh my memory, who, who made the the vehicles themselves? The basic chassis um, and kind of excellent so on. Champion was a very big company, and they and, you know it seems funny they all sort of. You know, purchase each other and then it becomes a large conglomerate. But the Champion brand uh, stopped, stopped manufacturing about a year ago. They didn't, they didn't manufacture a vehicle. 
ground up they did. Uh, they did uh, they, the engines were different than uh, the body and so forth, but not not all of it. I don't think any of the manufacturers are anything all the time. Well, in other words, Champion was making a unique vehicle. I wouldn't say that they did, to tell you the truth. I mean, certain things do go out after you understand what you can get at. I mean, if, if it were, say, a, a standard Ford or GMC or something like this, you expect the car to be available. But if it's if it's something that uh, was in Champion's imagination, they've gone out of business, that creates well, I guess I don't know where I do you have your car in here too. Some parts are taking much longer than to, to, to be done. And everybody, the supply chain is really decimated. Well, is the basic vehicle from GMC or Ford or other large manufacturer? Uh, no, I think Champion was the main. I'm not sure about the engine, to be honest with you. I think engine has statistics. Uh oh, the body, the taxi work. It suggests to me why you got to. A particularly difficult parts problem. Parts problem is widespread. It's not just champion bus, it's every manufacturer. Right now. Everyone. Uh, well, is that part, is that, so that, I have a basic question. Um, you, you said that it's not clear how the axle broke. I don't understand that. I'm not a mechanic, I'm no expert. But a broken axle usually makes itself clear pretty quickly. So when and how was the report of the broke, broken axle? Uh, um, how did that come up? I mean, on the day that it happened, was did it go over the curve? What happened? We suspect that that's probably what happened. We've spoken to the drivers on that day. Unfortunately, they're telling us no. I, I find that very hard to believe. We don't have a clear picture of how it happened. I don't think, I think it was probably more of a driver error than it was. We're in our regular drivers who are loved in the village. Right. This is a regular driver and drivers. It's a regular driver, but we don't know whether or not it was a a, a, a fraction that started to go bad, maybe from days earlier. We can't pinpoint when it happened. It just, it just did. It's not the kind of thing that just fails. Or parts. We think something, some kind of traumatic event caused it to happen. Very quickly, it's true sure. that the um, How many miles do the buses have as we speak? Uh, Gonna guess at this probably somewhere around forty thousand miles. Forty thousand miles. Three years. Two a little over two years. Two years. Yeah. Wow. Doesn't say much for champion. Question number two. But, um, but, but I'm sorry, I don't mean to be disrespectful. No, let's move on. Question number two, please. Um the bus driver that you have right now assigned yes. to us are the same bus drivers that have worked with us for a long time? Yes, there's a couple of newer ones, but yes. Because one of the reasons why we actually went for your company mm -hmm. was because these bus drivers were known to our community. If right. they somehow have been changed, then mm -hmm. It is what it is. Thank you so much. I don't know that. I mean, is anybody experiencing problems with the drivers right now? Just saying. Just saying. Thank you. Uh, the, you know, for the comments from council, appreciate you coming. But uh, as you can see, there's a great concern on the part of the mm -hmm. residents and the council. Right. I'm too concerned that there are many. Many residents who have mobility issues have come to depend upon the uh, the ADA compliant buses to get on and off, and especially when they were both down, uh, some very very serious inconvenience to the court. So um, I understand. We understand what you're, you're facing, but we we do we do need your best efforts to be better. We are giving a hundred percent. We will continue to give a hundred percent. Certainly understand the challenges here, and 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 we're concerned. Believe me, we are very concerned. Get this fair way so that everybody will be in a good position. The one bus is running right now. It's just 
to give it a lot of attention. We'll leave it a hold up just fine. Um, and um, I think everything going forward will be the way that it's supposed to be. But again, my apologies that these issues have happened. Uh, and I'm not trying to make excuses by any means, but these supply shortages are So that's the issue. Next item on our agenda is the uh, an update of the purchase of waste way to Avenue. Um, we are working on a close and check out the ground with the waste 608 or 5500. No, I think 4608 is the next one. No, Melody's already announced the 5500. She announced that earlier. It was just the announcement. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I, I see. Very good. Yeah. Uh, that we, we should have a close date very soon where we can track our agreement with uh, uh, 5,500 people. Say that it indicates that we have to close on that deal by the end of this month. Uh, we should have a closing date much sooner than that, probably somewhere around the 20th or 21st, I'm told. But uh, we're confirming that with our closing attorney. Uh, as has been mentioned in regards to community affairs, uh, committee report. We would we would contemplate a very open process of deciding how we would be using uh, the, uh, the facility once it's there, and we would also have to deal with questions of, uh, of, of repairs or upgrades or things of that sort, depending on how they're going to use it. Uh, you know, uh, I know Mike has a suggestion that she wants to. Uh, Wants to articulate. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at, at last, at the last meeting, uh, at the special call meeting we had uh, regarding the purchase of uh, forty six oh eight. Uh, many, many questions about uh, what uh, what usage would be made for that property, and uh, very important questions to ask. And I believe, Mr. Chairman, uh, the, you're going to have a a special. Uh, uh, Community wide meeting at some point. Well, we haven't we haven't, we haven't to get yeah, man, that down, which is for sale. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, I um, it, it came to me uh, walking around Village Lot and walking past the Red House. Uh, I, I I took notice of the parking area that they have there, and there's many. Everybody on the council knows many of the residents that some of those spots have been rented out to a, a few people over the years. And once we take uh, the, uh, ownership of, of the property, uh, it it seemed to me that we it would be a better use than renting out a handful of spots to a handful of people. That if we put con consider, and I'm, I'm just saying, I'm not making any motion or anything of that nature. And it sounds like the community uh, advisory committee is thinking about these lines that we possibly put in a. Uh, electrical vehicle charging station on that property. There are eight parking spaces there. Uh, so to me, it, it makes sense from a number of reasons. One, it's centrally located, uh, easily easy to install uh, as parking spots are right next to the house. So the, uh, the, the power source would only have to go a few feet to the outside of the building. Uh, again, there are uh, at least eight spaces available. The village staff really doesn't need any more parking because they have parking right underneath the village center here. Um, and many commuter, uh, and, and what I've learned is uh, many communities uh, such as Greenbelt, Hyattsville, and Tacoma Park are offering this service already. And the company that has installed their uh, systems are servicing about 150 communities in the mid Atlantic area. Uh, it's, it's, and this is what I've learned from people at these various uh, political subdivisions. Uh, it was given the name of the, the organization that the ones I just mentioned are using a group called the Electric Vehicle Institute. Um, a complete, uh, I wanted to point out a complete chart. Uh, there are three, three types of charges. One charger, uh, one first level takes two days to charge. Second level takes four hours to charge, and the third level takes 15 minutes. Um, the cost uh, that the, uh, when I asked the, the gentleman that they, these other uh, government groups were using, the cost for installation of four 
uh, two level charging units to zero. Uh, they, uh, they install the charging stations for free. Uh, the only responsibility that the government entities have is providing the uh, 240 volt line uh, and make it accessible on the exterior of, of the uh, of, of the of the buildings. Fortunately, for the spots in, at at the Red House, it's all within 10 to 15 uh, feet of each other. Um, the old, as we said, the, uh, the 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 uh, there's no charge for the installation, and they indicate he indicated to me that he would install four uh, two uh, uh, level two uh, systems four of them at no cost. And he said that what they do with, what they've done with all the other governments is they split the profit 50-50. But -50. Um, whatever they make, 50% 50, 50 goes back to the government entity, they keep 50%. Uh, and I asked him, when does this profit sharing begin? He said, immediately when they're installed. And I asked him, what was the cost for, for, for example, for a four hour charge. And he said, a four hour charge generally costs about $6. And, and, a, and a, a full charge is generally good for about 300 miles. Uh, so the cost saving is for people that have electrical vehicles is substantial. And I, and I just wanted to throw it out there to the community you know, to, you know, to think about and when the meeting is held, I just think it's a purpose that would give everybody the opportunity to use it as opposed to a handful of people renting apartments. But thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's, that's, that's all I have. I think the interesting suggestion that uh, I know a number of the buildings in the village are, are dealing with the issue of electric vehicles and trying to deal with the issue of, of, of remodeling their garages to deal with these things. Uh, I think uh, it's something that, uh, that we we can consider. And uh, I know there are a number of government agencies that provide support for this type of thing as well. So we can investigate this as we think about the uses of the Red House. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I should have said, so if we're talking about 4608, I would like to also suggest that as the work gets started on Page Park, uh, this council to consider saving those two benches that they have that are currently in Page Park. They're not fantastic, but we might be able to find some useful one at 4608 on, on the lower area where the grassy area is for that property. But grassy, don't they? Just, just a suggestion. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Uh, okay, uh, moving right along. Uh, discussion regarding the laws for which charter amendments expand accumulate authority. Uh, Julian, do you want to take us through this? Yes, uh, I believe Council Member Dorsey raised this initially as a challenge that we've had in terms of lack of emergency procurement authority in the current village charter. And really, since the creation of the village, the charter language does not really allow for any kind of emergency spending. So that was the initial uh, concern raised, and the Council. Uh, exploring the charter amendment to do this. Delegate Mark Corman since has expressed interest in helping us through this process. The process requires a state legislative action, essentially a bill to be introduced on, by the Maryland legislature. And Delegate Corman is the uh, chair of the Montgomery County delegation to the state legislature, is well situated to, to provide this for us and to shepherd it through. Um, Mayor White and I met with Delegate Corman and talked about the process, what would be required. And his response was that we should essentially indicate what we would like to see in a charter amendment. And then Delegate Corman's staff will draft it for us. And we can have the attorney, he will prepare the legislation for us and submit it through for the process to the, initially to the county delegation and then to the state legislature from this coming session, which begins in January. Um, concurrently, since we are looking to do this, the staff has expressed interest in updating, increasing the bid threshold amount while we're going through this procurement process. We think it's consistent with the emergency procurement authority that we're seeking 
is to also just give us more general procurement authority um, to be able to purchase things without advertising bids above five thousand dollars. The last time this has been increased was, I believe, nineteen ninety four. So it's going on thirty years that we've been at a five thousand dollar bid threshold limit, which um, pales in comparison to a lot of the other communities. This, as you see from the chart, that Jason did a lot of work and research polling in our neighboring municipalities. And specifically, uh, the town of Chevy Chase and Chevy Chase Village, which are the two probably most comparable to us in terms of budget and population and size, um, they've got charter limits of 25,000, 15,000, um, the town being the minor one in the village below them. So we are suggesting slash requesting the authority to raise our charter to $20,000 for the bid threshold limit. Um, and I would also add, we've had a few occasions, of, more than a few occasions of um, inefficiency in being able to address something in bigger work at the village. One of which is on the agenda tonight that we have to wait a few months to hopefully get for a leak in the kitchen, just because it was a little bit over $5,000. We couldn't fix it when we get to go after this. So, um, we are seeking that in addition to the procurement authority for emergencies. Um, I mentioned in the memo there's language in the Oakmont charter, which we could adopt, uh, which looks relatively simple for the emergency procurement authority if the council supports that. Also, request that we increase the bid threshold. So, the, the, the request to increase the bridge, the uh, bid threshold is. From twenty thousand dollars, is that? That's you know, staff's request. Exactly, yes. Uh, and so, the delegate delegate Corman indicated the support, raising it to whatever level the council. Is, what about what would be the and, and why don't you describe what would be the emergency? The emergency so we can go about that. Well, the Oakmont language, which I quoted in the memo. And then and we could, you know, Mark Corman may suggest other language, but the language they have is that the Oakmont Citizens Committee, which is their equivalent of the Village Council, may by unanimous vote enter into a contract exceeding $10,000, which is their bid limit, without seeking competitive bids in the event that such contract is necessary to be an emergency. Mm -hmm. So that could be, that's an example of language we would adopt. It would just simply be a council vote. They say it's theirs as unanimous. It would not require advertising for bids to address whatever emergency. So the actual one actually says that, that it doesn't have require the full council. It uh, would uh, the town manager in consultation with the mayor or treasurer, in other words, for an emergency, uh, tracking down some of our council uh, might be, especially if it was unanimous, it destroyed the idea of a rapid. Emergency response. I think it should be in line with the town of Chevy Chase. The emergency use there needs to be approval of the mayor or treasurer um, or, or two council members. I mean, in an emergency, you don't have to put down seven people. For suggestions, comments? I'm going to see both, both the mayor and the treasurer. We have a motion. Well, well, I think that, that we might only be nice if we should not vote things in. Uh, but if we're going to make an emergency expenditure, uh, I can understand that we should not necessarily be that specific uh, council. But I would assume the majority, if we're going to spend, we shouldn't be spending public funds without the majority of the council supporting it in this emergency. Uh, now, well, we presently, Mr. Chairman, we presently do for five thousand. The manager rules versus. No, I understand that. No, no, I, 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 there are two separate issues here. One is raising the uh, limit so that that the union, the management, can do things without consulting the council. Just go you know, out for bids and get the job done, or not even get the bids. You know. And the second thing is emergencies, which. I obviously would exceed that, let's say $20,000 limit. My view is that we should 
we should include the twenty thousand dollar limit. Uh, but then that gives you the freedom to act when you need to act. But if you need to go above that in an emergency basis, that should require a majority of the council. I certainly. Yeah. That's what you just said. I mean. Is everybody? Yes. Well, my kids are reacting. That Yes, sir. Second. Okay. Can I say what I think the motion is? Yeah. Uh, in urgent circumstances, staff may make purchases of up to $20,000. No, no, no. In the, the, the ordinary circumstances, they can make purchases up to $20,000. In emergency circumstances, they, they they don't have to go out for bidding as long as they get the uh, they get the approval of the majority. So in, in urgent circumstances, staff may make purchases without without soliciting bids. Is that it? It's got two parts. Yeah, two parts. Part one is we're saying currently the staff can spend five thousand dollars without without soliciting bids. We're saying they can now spend up to twenty thousand dollars without soliciting bids. If they want to spend more than that, they either have to solicit bids or if it's an emergency situation, they can forego bids with the majority support of the council. Yes, this would be discussed with Delby Corman, who will have control over it, and the manager of Delby Corman will come up with some language that we would then see before it goes through everything. I don't think we have to vote again, but they keep us abreast. Okay. All those in favor of this is Bruce. Aye. Unanimous. Same interest in the dog. Still kind of so bad. Loyal people stand here. Uh, to begin the discussion, the discussion I'd like to ask uh, Norman Knopf, who has been the council's liaison on this issue for uh, since the beginning of time, since Genesis. So, <laughs> Uh, so, Norm, why don't you, why don't you uh, take the microphone and explain how we got here and what the issues are as you see it, and then we can discuss among ourselves. We will do. I, you pointed me the liaison for the French Village uh, with the adjacent communities, the Citizens Coordinating Committee, Brookdale, and Somerset. Uh, what I'd like to do is very briefly uh, tell, report to you where we are now. And in that process, the point reminds you, because I think you're familiar with it, and particularly the public, of what the actual situation is as compared to much misunderstanding in the community. 1995, 27 years ago, the county parks bought an acre of land on Willard. That's the acre is the is the cyclone fence. Yeah. Thank you. It's the cyclone fence with a house on it. That land has sat there for 27 years. It was supposed to be converted into parkland in recognition by the county that they had a lot of density in the friendship heights and you need more parkland. For 27 years, it's been a house rented and there's been no public access to that property and it is not part of the parkland. It's not part of Willard Avenue in this park. It's just sitting there. Now, there are very thing, few things certain in the world. But let's get one thing straight. One thing is certain. There has been no money to convert that one acre into parkland, and there will be no money so converted. We have been told by council. We've been told by park and planning because there are huge demands for parks throughout the county, and we are not on the high priority list. And we face the choice of going another 27 years or Lord knows how many, looking at a cyclone fence with the house. However, in the last uh, few, literally year, money became available for a dog park. And the question was posed to the council and the communities, would you like a dog park or would you like another 27 years of a cyclone fence with a house on it rented out to a private party? That is the choice. And many people say, oh, that can't be. Trust me, 
This council has tried for years, we've tried for years to get money, not getting it. So the council said, as the adjacent community said, what does a dog park involve? The dog park proposed is you have an acre of land there. The dog park will be approximately one quarter of an acre. The other three quarters will be converted into regular park use. And this uh, council member's recommendations were make it park use for people that have ambulatory care problems and that caters to our demographic senior citizens. Put in wine paths, put in benches to sit down, trees, what have you. And we can, if you don't have a dog, maybe you can watch the dogs. The idea struck a sympathetic chord with all the communities that maybe in lieu of a cyclone fence, we can have a dog park and we can have a regular park. And so that was the choices. And I believe the communities all said to park the planning, go ahead and keep planning on this, and see what you come up with and to come with a final design. And so that's where we are, except led by people who don't like the dog park. And it is understandable there are people on Willard Avenue, the single family homes in particular, that are against the dog park. They mounted a petition and there's some uh, 370 or whatever it is names on the petition. 293. 293, thank you. 293 it is. Um, of that, it went to park and planning and park and planning said to the communities, oh, I thought you wanted a dog park. With this many signatures, now we have to rethink it. So we took a look at the petition. First thing we noticed was about 30% of the petitioners lived in Potomac, Rockville, Silver Spring, and so on. So we had to remove those. But that leaves a lot of petitioners right here in the village and elsewhere that signed the petition. So we've taken a careful look at the petition. And the petition itself gives the following impression. It seems to say, would you like a nice park, gardens, Nice park scene with a house and community use of the house, such as plays and community meetings. Or would you like a dog park? Well, guess what? <laughs> it came out very heavily. People signed the petition. They didn't want a dog park. Similarly, um, I have spoken to some people that have signed the petition. And they are under the impression, and you heard it here tonight, from well-meaning people who understandably are concerned. First misimpression was we're replacing the idyllic park that we have now for the dog park. This land is not part of the Willard Avenue Park yet, and it is not replacing any existing Willard Avenue Park feature. This is adding to it. That's very important. And perhaps the most important thing is if you don't like the dog park, then you will just get a cyclone fence with a house around it be rented. As part of the planning board's uh, review of this problem, of this uh, project, they looked into the historic value of the house and they concluded that it is not a historic value, so they did not have a problem taking it down. That is what they reported to us. So the bottom line is that is the status. Park and planning is now thinking about whether they want to go ahead with it because of the tremendous opposition that has come from a lot of the community. If this council believes that their original approach um, still stands, that they think it would be a value to have a park for seniors and also a dog park, then I think it would be helpful if you can, could convey that information to park planning again, that you still support. So uh, that's a long story. But I'm trying to set the record. That's no, where we could are. you could you also indicate uh, which which community groups signed on to this original uh, to the to the uh, support the dog right. park? The citizens coordinating me on Friendship mm -hmm. Heights, which is 20 um, citizens groups in and around the Friendship Heights area. The Brookdale Citizens Association, the Brookdale Citizens Association. Uh, which is the Willard Avenue community and then going up toward uh, Western Avenue, uh, sent a letter in support after they got a lot of black from Willard Avenue residents 
They sent another letter in department planning, listing the concerns of those on Willard and asking department planning to uh, try to mitigate each of those concerns when they proceeded with designing the park. They did not look for others. And similarly, Somerset sent a letter in saying that they wanted to pursue the park. They thought it was a good idea, uh, but now they are, um, they would like to have park planning come back to Somerset and the mayor wants them to come back to Somerset and make a special presentation to the town council explaining what they're doing. So I'm not quite sure exactly what their position is, but that, that's where we are. Hey, Bruce. Bruce, sorry, um, the, the, the property is one acre, and according to the proposal, a quarter acres for the dog park, and three quarters goes to what other purpose? Could you would say when we rent little barn, there'll be paths, there'll be benches, there, and so on. Around around the one quarter of an acre. Why? Why do the dogs only get one quarter in this surrounding? <laughs> I assume the people sitting on benches get three quarters. I don't understand. Yes. Uh, I believe the reason is it's explained in them. There are some things known as uh, urban dog parks. And this is an urban dog park. A normal dog park requires much larger territory. But these are small urban dog parks that they have several throughout the county. They have them in DC and they find they work very well. They cater to the local neighborhood. People walk their dogs rather than travel at a distance to come and bring their dogs. And these smaller, um, the smaller geographic areas, they say work out fine. I don't. I can't imagine that the dogs I know. Dogs need to run. I don't understand why they only get one quarter of the available area. It seems put a mile away. A little bit should seem. Well, the park planning is going to come back to the communities with their if, if they proceed with more details, and that could be a suggestion. But my understanding is that they have um these uh, this size elsewhere. And that they've worked out well. I think you're raising a good question, but I'm just I'm just the mayor. Well, I told her, I told her, I told her, I told her I, just speaking as a dog for a moment, I can imagine being half a quarter acre while there's three quarters of acre people watching me. I don't understand that at all. Well, I didn't I didn't quite make it sound like they had the stadium around and watch you. Know, no. uh, just only watch you while we see it that way. Please clarify this for me. Yes. I'm, I'm a little confused because for many years now, buildings here, the Elizabeth Willoughby, right? Owners of dogs have been after me for a dog park. Okay. These are residents of Friendship Heights. Now, I don't know where. Where the beef is coming from, I don't understand. Can you where where the the opposition is coming yeah. from? I I think my understanding is if you read the petition, the petition gives the impression that the existing park, which people love, is going to be disturbed. The chain they're going to have dog parks running right next to the creek and so on, and it also gives the impression that you can get some other lovely things rather than the dog if you don't take the dog uh, that and that's why i've spoken to people on the phone and i just inquire i said you signed this why did you do it and they told me well they don't want the lovely park destroyed they didn't understand even where it was uh, the pollution is another issue but as far from planning has said in detail they have the, the topography is such that they're setting aside land to catch all the pollution and have it all drain into that area so it doesn't go into the creek and so on. I don't want to get into all the details, yeah. but the bottom line is I think there's been a lot of misunderstanding. There's also some in the community that want to preserve the house. But again, if they're successful in stopping the dog park, we will preserve the house, but it will be rented out for private purpose and we'll have a cyclone fence continue around it and we will not have an acre park. 
because the park itself right now is pretty abandoned. I mean, it doesn't get the upkeep that it should. It doesn't really, it's not really, I, I go there with some frequency. Not true. Look, and it's just, it they, doesn't They really recently put in more children's equipment. They brought it for the ball park and so on. I think it's being in or used then, yes. And they bought, they had bought two houses along Willard, which would be torn down with any span of park. Everybody who's spoken has had chance to speak about the door clock. This is this this is this is I'm sorry, this is council. This is the council's operation. But this is not this is not a, a town hall meeting. We're not speaking with the ball spoken. We're not speaking in regards to this. This acknowledgement. Located by the council for some time to deal with this issue. So these are according to the council, and then we're going to have we will we'll, we'll discuss. Uh, go ahead. The two houses, the one on the corner of River Road and, and Willard, has been purchased by Park and Planning, and one other house along Willard uh, has been purchased by Park and And of course, in addition, there's the house that's a dispute here. Thank you. I will go ahead. Well, I don't know where to begin, so let me begin with the park. The four of us park. How many people here remember when it was in the park and testified to the county to purchase? How many people? Yeah, I think only Mr. Kamal and myself. And we very strongly supported that park, and it wasn't easy getting the county to put in uh, what was up to now considered a whole bunch of things in this petition. Um, there can be improvements, fine, but uh, those people that fought so hard in Brookdale and in Friendship Heights, the last thing in the world we'd want is to hurt that part. So I listen very carefully. I, I appreciate, especially the people that live on the Moon Avenue, I think they have concerns. Personally, I would hope that there could be some ways to ameliorate those concerns. Um, I think there can be a certain uh, amount of, of foliage or, or, or noise bumpers or something put up. And the remainder of the acre, uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Perman, indicates that dogs like to run free. That's the problem. The dogs, and there are almost 350 dogs. I went to each manager. 350 dogs. They're not all used the dog park, but the 350 dogs in the high rise community, including uh, Wisconsin Place. And I moved in 25, or almost 50 years ago, to Friendship Heights. One building, Joe Booth was Elizabeth, allowed dogs, and there were about 12 dogs. There are now 350 dogs. That doesn't count Brookdale. It doesn't count Somerset. It doesn't count the high rises. Those dogs, by law, cannot be allowed to run anywhere. It's one thing to have them on the leash, and we know something went on the leash the park too. But uh, dogs that can't run, are not socialized, they're more likely to be uh, not the, the happiest dogs. And there are a lot of owners who moved here because this is a balanced community. We have elderly, we have youngsters, and we have a lot of dog owners. There has to be a way that you can live together. I have great empathy for the people that are moving Avenue. I sincerely think that the noise will not bother them. I mean, if they somehow get used to the noise of buses and uh, ambulances rushing down Willard Avenue throughout the day, I don't think that dogs barking remotely around the clock. That's my personal opinion. But they are entitled to their opinion. Um, and we should respect it. Um, I have a greater problem understanding why 30% of the petition were from people from Helmick, Rockville, Silver Street, okay. Tennessee. Well, excuse me, I went through the names separately for Mr. Ross. I, I saw the addresses, I counted them up. I, I, I think that has been physical. Actual stuff. I have the original. Well, I have a copy of the petition here. I have a copy of the petition here. Right. 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 Right
stop from having a party in the park and they use the park. They have a relative that lives on Willow and they come and use the park right to So 30%. Not 30%. It, it is. is. It's recounted in numbers. Michael. Yeah. First, Mr. Chairman, not just point to those folks here that are opposed to the park, but it, it, it seems that each month now, um, when issues of importance come in, come up, one of the first things that residents point out is they don't have an opportunity to weigh in. It happened last, not last month, but the month before, or, or at the special meeting that we had. Um, we were accused of not giving people an opportunity to, to weigh on the issues then. And again, tonight, earlier on, I think the gentleman has already left. Uh, we welcome, we welcome uh, uh, people here open to the entire community to come every month. I've been coming, as I, I stated this last special meeting, for eight years, and I missed one meeting in, in eight years. Uh, so when I hear residents come in saying that they haven't had an opportunity to weigh in, it's because they don't take the time to come here and sit through these meetings to weigh in. Now, having said that, the gentleman that passed this out, this is exactly years ago when this issue started, as, our, our, as Mr. Knopf states, is what we would have liked to have seen, an open park where people who didn't uh, had mobility issues and so forth could use it. We've had multiple meetings with the count, uh, county planning and so forth, as Mr. Knopf has said, and as he has stated, they won't give you any money for that. Now, I understand lobbying. If you want to kill something, you, you kill it with kindness. Uh, but for years, we've been working on this. And for people that, that live in 4701, a building that allows dogs in and then places signs on their property for the residents not to use their uh, property for the dogs to relieve themselves, I think it's hypocritical. So, so Mr. Mr. Moeller, you've had everybody from 4701 in that group into the 30% because I think it's hypocritical for you to allow people to have dogs in your building and then send them to other buildings to relieve themselves. And I've seen it. So don't nobody's going to sit in here and tell me I haven't seen it. Let's let's forward this to control. Nobody's going to tell me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me let me, let me count my my whole all of this decision. Uh, the uh, I think it goes back at least three four, three years or so since so I'm on the council. Uh, my concern about the property has been and comes from my little branch, my little political classes, that this is public property paid for by the taxpayers. And it is now for the last 20, how many years? 27. 27 years been devoted to the private use of whoever rents that house. A public property, and, and it's not just a house, it's a very large piece of property surrounded by a fence that I can't get into, nobody else in this building in this room can get into, cannot access. But it's own right to tax builders and use for the private, private enjoyment of whoever's living in that house. I that that bothers me. Um, I personally have testified before the Montgomery County House on two occasions, calling the situation to their attention. I received sympathetic nods and told that the priority list for parks because of my, my, my proposal. Thing I was saying is, house keep the house, tear down the house. I don't care. Just just turn the property over to public use. Have nice path. Have fat seniors uh, be a, a place to sit. Do something nice there. It should be used for the public because it's a public property. Nobody seems to care and. Uh, and after knocking my head against the snow wall for some time, my mother told me that the best thing to do was to stop or else you can't get it. Well, a few months back, 
I was able to secure a meeting with Casey Anders and the Tifliger of the Lord Figueroa, who was the in charge of the parks, um, Councilman Teresa, a uh, broker that meeting. And I met with them, and this was your right, this was after the Norwood Park fiasco. And I was told that if if we were willing to accept a dog park or a skate park, then, and I quote directly from Mr. Anderson, the park, Willard Park would move to the top of the list, the very long, long list of was at the top of the list. They were not interested in anything else. They weren't interested in seniors. They weren't interested in accessibility. They weren't interested in, in, in community meetings or any community meetings in the house or anything of that sort. This was, this was the deal. And so my view was then, first of all, my view was that this seemed like a good deal for us. For the county, for the village. Now, obviously, it's outside the village. We don't have the money in it. We can't control it. It's all controlled by the council planning. As, as Councilman Dorsey said, I brought the thing to this council. We talked about it. We discussed it. Open meeting just like this. And we decided to support this particular uh, initiative. And as Mr. Kamal has indicated, other groups in the area make the same decision to support that. So that's where we are, and that's 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 how we came we came to be here. No one did you have to do. I just wanted to point out um, during the pandemic, I sat in the library reading room and took advantage of the Wi-Fi here in the building. Well. Um, I was not able to go to the office, and I had a perfect view of the big grassy area at 5550 Friendship. And I was astounded at the number of dogs that used that area all day long, all morning, all afternoon, and into the evening. And I did not notice any particularly loud barking there, but I think I was struck by the fact that at any time, the owner of 5550 could fence in that property. He could simply say, no, you cannot walk your dogs on this large open lot. You cannot come here for your exercise classes. And he's being very generous with that property right now. But why do we have to depend on private property for a place for our dogs to run? There are 4,500 residents of Friendship Lights. Uh, and as Al said, 350 dogs, that's a lot of people and dogs. And if we can provide a dog park that's within easy distance for seniors to access, I think we have an obligation to do that. Um, I, I think to ignore the fact that our dogs have nowhere to run is, is irresponsible. And as a village council, we're responsible for the residents here and their, their pets, and that's why I'm in favor of turning this into a dog park. Let me, let me, just, let me just let me add one thing to my own statement. I've used the phrase before, I don't have a dog in this fight because I'm not a dog owner. I live in a building where so you're not supposed to have dogs, but I'm, and so this is. This is not involving in, in that way. Norm, thank you. Uh, take a load off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not, I don't know. I don't know. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. I'm going to allow, I'm going to allow anybody who wishes to speak 30 seconds for a final comment of dinner. Then the councils want to go. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I am the one who wrote the petition, and uh, first, a lot of what he, what Mr. Knopf said, many, much of it is false. I'm the only one that has, I, it's not 30%. I will, I will give you the exact number that is highly inflated. Um, one thing I will tell you is, I, we're willing to work with you all to get a dog park. This particular location is not a good one, but there are plenty of other locations that we can get. And I don't know, I don't see, I don't understand the aversion to using private land. If you want to 
give it to us and let us use it. Why the immersion? If this is if this area is going to be ill suited for a dog park, why don't we use an area that would be? But this land is already owned by the by the And I've actually um I've actually talked to parks and we put the you know the rent that they're charging for the house. You know, it's under market by like four thousand dollars. Four thousand. And you know, they told me it's affordable housing. Um, there's a really nice Audi. What was it? A five. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not affordable housing. You're making. You're making one. But what I'm telling you is that what we offer them, there there are lots of solutions that we can come up with that don't involve the dog park in that particular spot of land. But we can find one if we work together. We are willing to work with you to find an area that we need. I don't think you're willing to work with us, we will work with you because otherwise we can get 500 plus names. We can right. get more people. That was we got those signatures right. a week and a half. 30 cents. Okay. I would just like to say this is what the park service showed us the July 20th of what this dog park is going to look like. And as you'll see, it's not a third of it's for the dogs and three fourths of it's for somebody else. What you'll see here is this is the street. This is the dog park. This is the whole dog park. This is, there is not three quarters of a person. Uh, well, that's fine. Yes, ma'am. President, you can't that the parks department has no money bought two pieces of property on the street and paid over a million, probably a million and a half at least for the two pieces of the money. <laughs> but they couldn't afford to do something to do to make a park for us. That's ridiculous. Yeah. They tell us what they're going to do. They're going to make a nice entrance on River Road. Who wants to walk to River Road to go into that park? Mm -hmm. I th and also that they didn't even follow their own procedures, what they said were the standards for their park in terms of the distance from residences, the, light, the layout, et cetera. And they said to us, well, those are just thought. Uh, well, that was their story. Bobby, in the back, 30, please, 30 seconds, you do have to move on here. Now, suppose you found out the parks and plan has a different point of view now. That, that, that. We're telling you exactly what you want to hear, Bobby. That, you know, I'm telling you to pay. If not, the same. I, I, think, think, it's not. I think, Michael, I think, Michael. With no disrespect, many of the members of the council, but perhaps another conversation in parks about other uses for that property, don't do the dog park, may still may, may be under consideration. And if if that's okay with you, and many of us can find working with you in parks an alternative site for dog parks, which can serve these residents but not be in that space, I can't understand why. Council wouldn't be supportive of that. And I can tell you that as you heard here, some of the information that you are giving the public and that others are giving you is simply not correct. And that's been the, the story all along. It started in my best month in March. I was given this information as I talked to you. Thank you. Please, when, just uh, very quickly, please. When I heard that, uh, Dr. Miller asked the question about where are our dogs going to play. I started uh, a little answer to that, and I'd like to share it with you by email. Uh, and if you give me your email addresses, all of you, uh, I'll be happy to share. Well, to the to the man. Uh, historic preservation is that the planning department has worked extensively with the parks department. I do perhaps want to clarify something. Parks has a cultural resource mission. Historic houses in parks are part of their vision or other historic or cultural items. They did, in fact, write up an analysis, which I read when I was in historic preservation, where they found it to have historic significance. It does not have to be formally on the master plan for historic preservation, a locational atlas, for parks to consider it a cultural resource. So in closing, I have enjoyed the cultural resource of the park for 28 years. I consider it a part of the park. 
I'm very happy with its environmental setting being intact. To me, this is part of the park and it's been part of the trail experience. So some people may not experience it part of, as part of the park, but other people do. Thank you. Mr. Chair, do I have a motion? All right, well, I move and then I'll discuss it. I move that uh, we uh, use uh, the, the uh, talking points of Mr. Knopf to send a letter reaffirming our earlier decision. And uh, I, I so move, and I move on to comment. Second. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, again, I have sympathy basically for the people that live on Willard Avenue. I think your apprehension is misplaced. I don't say that disrespectfully. Really, I don't. The um, fact is that there are no places that can be assured uh, as a dog park unless the county or we own it. We have tried, the village council has tried to purchase or rent property within our village. Uh, the owners looking forward that they think they'll be able to have a development there, another building, they don't want to have a dog park there. Uh, Geico is not going to use its property for a dog park. They're waiting for the new sector plan so they can have tons of, in my opinion, high rise buildings which will tower over Brookdale. So I doubt that Geico is going to be very perceptive. And the big lawn over here, uh, that's private property. Private property can be designated for a dog park, only a government that has property itself. We cannot purchase property down here. We, the council, have never felt that that Willard Avenue Park should be uh, in any way undermined. Of course, if there are ways to improve it, that's fine. But the dog park will not go in the present park. And one last thing. In the petition, and I'm happy to look through again, but I, I tell you, there were lots of, of signatures here from streets that were Rockford, Potomac, Silver Spring, etc. cetera. Uh, the, the house uh, on the property, uh, this is on a petition, could be used, I'll read it, as a recreation and meeting space for community events, such as meetings, lectures, art and exercise classes, book clubs, holiday parties, end of quote. That's what this center is for. That's what this center, and it is open to the public, and some of the people that are neighbors on Willard Avenue use this. This is a community center. That small little building uh, is not going to be in any way competitive with what we built here. It's just not. I'm sorry. There are no places for the dogs to run legally. It is dangerous and illegal for them to be running on private property. People that own homes can fence in their property. Their dogs can run free. 350 people that live in high rises cannot. And the nearest uh, high rise is, is at least a house away. It's not right next to it. I just don't understand why people in little towers think somehow they're going to smell or hear dogs incessantly. I just don't. I'm sorry. I disagree. You're entitled to your opinion. I respect it, but I respectfully just refer to this. Yeah. Yeah. It's Dr. Mullen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't understand. I'm not showing you. I've been in pain for years. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. If you do, in fact, we've had ample, in fact, we, excuse me, ma'am, we've had ample time to make the point. The council is now, the council is now ready to make its decision about what it wishes to do. And as I hope you know, this decision is not dispositive. Kind of parks is going to do what parks going to do. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm not sure, you know, will prevail or whether you will prevail or whether the other groups will prevail, but we need to make our decision about what we want to do. Is there further comment on this from the council? All right. The, the motion, 
the motion before the council is that we we draft the letter renewing our support for the dog. Uh, and uh, we will involve uh, the public's confidence in drafting that letter. All those in favor, Scott. Uh, Aye. Since opposed, thank you. Onward. Um, I have shared with you and submitted a draft for a um, a commemorative plaque for our neighbor, Cleonese Cleo Tavani. Um, my suggestion is that the plaque should read, in sincere appreciation and gratitude for your unrelenting work in making this part possible for our community. And it's signed by the Village of Friendship Heights. And as you may recall, I have the letter of, um, I will call her our Grandam in Friendship Heights, um, Miss Barbara Talbot, who sent us an email when initially we had agreed to include her name on the plaque. And she has indicated that as a community leader, Cleo Tavani initiated actions to prevent, to protect and prevent residents from overdevelopment and in, in the location of the park. I know she worked tirelessly with members and staff at the county council, the planning board, and others to ensure that there would be, there would not be another high rise on that vacant park. Um, and she, this is Ms. Talbot, thanks us for thinking of her as a participant in that effort, but she played no role in the subsequent action that resulted in the more green space for the village. And she had, she indicates that the recognition belongs solely to the So are you putting that in the form of a motion? I am putting this in the form of a motion. And should anyone wish to um, think? Um, is there a second? I second. A second? Is there further discussion? Uh, Carolina, thank you for your uh, suggestions. I I think that it would be nice if the plaque were to uh, be a little bit more formal in the language. So could perhaps say something along the lines of in sincere appreciation and gratitude to Cleo Nietzsche, Cleo Tavani for her unrelenting work. So that it's not addressed to Cleo, it's addressed in the, in the third person, I guess. And I also had mentioned earlier that you might want to do if it's a bronze plaque, we could do a small um, illustration of her face. So. Um, you've seen those in historic harbors. But we're taking that and we're setting that as I, I had some I had some suggestions too. Uh, in this connection, I thought that I had a plan that we could look at uh, the, the format and, and uh, I, I think I would follow this. It's a little hard to see, mm -hmm. uh, but it's minor. It's sort of a back was up in the balls. Yeah, so no, but it, I, I, obviously it would be way bigger. Just, uh, sure. But um, what I like about this was prepositions were, were by themselves, so you mm -hmm. had more room to, for the your uh, important words to well, could we could we leave the the uh the design design yeah sure to the, uh, that, to the... I wanted to suggest the language I would use because I think what's best when something is outdoors uh to abbreviate a little and uh maybe maybe not use as many words my, as my, my experience is that several people say things that I edit some of the things that I So, so, so could, could we agree in principle to the sign and have, have uh, Paula, uh, uh, Carolina, 
known the agreed to the exact word in the paper. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so this would uh, shrink it. Um, with sincere gratitude to Theo Kalani for her tireless work to make Page Park uh, available to our community. It's just shorter. And I think we should name the part in the, in the sentence. Yeah, but I mean, can we delegate the script? We can delegate the priest to object. Based on the, the, my question would be to Bruce. Um, we talked about a signature tree, right? Where the clock would be. Um, which signature tree were you thinking of? Like to put here the signature tree. There will be also plaques describing what page part you can see the signature tree, right? There's a total of the units. The notion was that the plaque would go in a in a physical area under a signature tree, right? This is I certainly have no objection. Right. Yes. The coordination with whatever plaque describes the part of the page, that's all I'm going to ask. Thank you. All those in favor of allowing this to go forward to slash my vote on this issue. Aye. Aye. Surprisingly enough, we're now in new business. Red lights. <clears throat> right, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I move that the village lifted in to replace 110 street lamps with light emitting diodes having output, including color, similar to existing lamps. I second. Yeah, let me just be paucus verbis to this. And say everything is to sell the pit comes. Exactly. I could still so, and say that I I think from a safety standpoint, there's nothing to choose between the there's nothing to choose between the white light and the the more mellow yellow light. Nothing to choose. Yeah. But it would make an enormous difference in the appearance of the village. Because we have, I may say, a romantic appearance at night with the yellow, the yellow light. That is to say, the longer wavelengths, the uh, warmer yellow light, high end of the spectrum. Uh, and fortunately, the price would have come down. Go ahead. Just a, First of all, congratulations. This is a project I had brought up several times, two years ago. And it is a question, and that will be very much like my colleague, um, Councilman Dorsey. I think it's important to know. It's just a question of the appropriate time, the appropriate financial situation to make this possible. So I cannot possibly congratulate you on this initiative because you are making my day. This is a dream come true. I've always wanted to have better lives for the village. Thank you. We move the question. For your motion? Yes. So we get my with you. Got a motion. You may vote. Yep. You may vote. Yep. All those in favor of the So we get in the yellow ones rather than the, the hybrid one. So certain. Aye. Aye. Uh, discussion vote on bids for kitchen exterior wall repair. Julian? Yes, uh, we have a leak in the kitchen that's coming in under the dishwasher sink, and it's been diagnosed as a waterproofing issue from the exterior wall right in the side of um, the auditorium. So the uh, we've been advertised for bids. We received six proposals uh, recommending the bid for multi services general contractor for seven thousand four twenty five, which also happens to be well spent. They did a very nice job for us uh, recently repairing. Uh, so have a motion. Motion. Second. 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 Second.
Of course, she moves less about less to a certain question. Uh, I'm a little puzzled while uh, there were eight bids or seven bids, and seven of them were $12,000 or more, as high as 32000 Why is this one, I don't want to look again for it in the mouth, why is this one only 7445 The others are 18000 20000 26000 15000 this is usually the same that outline. I'm wondering the groups like all the others discuss. Yeah, this is generally it's, it's really not a large area and it's basically outside of the wall. Thirty thousand dollars is nuts. Mr. Chairman, in my, in my humble opinion. Mr. Chairman, I, I guess it would suggest that uh, Julian has stated that they've done work for us bef before, and a lot of the work when contractors did projects like this, they base it on a square foot price. And so they're probably basing it on past bids that they've done here, and they didn't drive it up. That's, I think if you probably look back at some of the other work per square foot, it probably would work out to be right in the range that they generally have done their other work for. Uh, thank you for that. I, I think that might be a possibility. And the rest of them are just trying to they looked at the zip code, 20815. Yes. I mean, I raise the charge. I raise the question. All those in favor of accepting the uh, bid is recommended by Andrew. Say aye. 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 Last to the uh, National League of Cities. Do you, do you, do you have a no, no. question? I don't know. This is the time of the evening. Uh, this is certainly nothing time sensitive whatsoever, but. Just uh, to consider joining the National League of Cities, we've heard anecdotally from some of the municipal neighbors that it does have some beneficial aspects. I always thought of it as more for larger cities, um, but we have learned that some smaller municipalities have been seem to find that's quite beneficial um, to do this. Well, when we contacted them, they quoted us to 871. Um, I, so, I mean, technically, we would be in the twelve hundred dollar category because our population is just over five thousand. It is twenty census. Our population is over five thousand. Yeah. So from the twenty twenty census, is it twenty ten? What would I think? Say? Actually, their dues are based on the twenty ten, right? Yeah. So they quoted us to eight seventy one as as our. What, what would be our dues price to say? I was that we joined the National League of Cities for $871. So, second. Second. All those in favor? Can I have a motion to uh, get the wording? Motion to uh, adjourn uh, and move it to closed session. Closed session for Maryland Code, General's Article, Section 305B1 to discuss the appointment and appointment assignment, promotion, discipline, promotion, compensation, removal, reservation, performance evaluation from appointee, employees, or officials over whom this body has jurisdiction or any other personal matter. Like some of the more specific individuals, was there a motion to that effect? Move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. The last thing everybody can do is something. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.